Hello everybody, do I have a book for you today? But before we get started, I'm going to talk about the work that I'm engaged in. I'm writing a book on Hannah Arendt and psychology and psychologism. And uh, I'm learning a lot. And one of the interesting things that I'm learning is that, funnily enough, even though I'm talking about things that are against the personal as political, against the feminist hive mind idioms, I'm finding a lot of women <laughs> writers, amazing women writers. So three amazing books that I recommend for everybody is Hegel's Social Ethics by Molly Farnett, which I think I did a did a analysis on on my channel already. The second book is Conflict is Not Abuse, and another amazing book. I didn't do a specific analysis on that one, but those ideas are found throughout my Unwitting Colonizers series. And Finally, this book right here is such an amazing book. Uh, it's called Psychoanalysis, History, and Radical Ethics, Learning to Hear. And there's another book on learning to listen. Listen, hearing, it's a philosophical distinction and something not that important for us. But Donna Orange, wow, what a book this is. I think this is the best one out of the three books I just mentioned because it's just so jam-packed with citations. And that's how you know a book is good. And compared to all this affirmative action inflation of publish or pu die repeating the same hive mind idioms culture is it's really funny compared to that compared to what has to be done in terms of real intellectual work into real and i say intellectual versus academic because that's a distinction that leo strauss makes and leo strauss makes a dif distinction between academia and intellect the in the actual intellectuals the real ones who want to actually do the real work for all those silenced by abuses of power and destruction of trust especially those destroyed and abandoned by patriarchal re uh, religious groups okay fine so she has to also talk about this the patriarchy i'm not sure why it's a big thing so far but let's just get into this uh it's gonna be a really it's gonna be a really good show for you guys Introduction. Learning to hear. Several years ago, my left ear, without medical explanation, suddenly went completely deaf. I could no longer locate sounds, could no longer hear music or voices ex except monophonically, and missed much of what was said to me around me. Much of what most people take for granted has gone. I tried hearing aids, but nothing was left to aid. Because I live in a country where single-sided deafness is Defined as a non-problem, a cochlear implant became impossible only five years later through a clinical trial. Meanwhile, life took on a dull, gray, depressive, and isolating cast. Conversations went on around me, but it often became useless to pretend that I could follow. This invisible disability leaves one alone because only other deaf people realize what is not happening. One cannot hear and is unheard like victims of normalized vi violence, suffering in a fog, but without the justified outrage. After the surgery consisting of implanting hardware between skin and skull, threading wires through drilled holes into cochlea, it was time to learn to hear again. With persistent and systematic training, I learned to find language within noise, just as one does in hearing a second or third language. The electronic input from the implant gradually interrogate itself with what I still heard in my acoustic ear. It was not nearly as good as new, but not as impaired as before. And this is one of the things that it's so difficult to explain to people who only are monolingual. The English language not only has within itself a theology. Ask, go to ask ChatGPT, ask, is theology embedded in the English language? It's more than just a theology. It's an imperialist ideology within the English language itself. One of the things I'm studying is how the early Freudian translations, catharsis, all of these words, they were conscious decisions by English psychoanalysis. And that's, those are the kinds of things that became popularized in the English speaking world. Where do these psychologisms, hive mind psychologisms come? And one of my, the other two thinkers is Leo Strauss, Hannah Arendt, and Karl Krauss, which we have to also take a look at. And I'm going to use those in my citations in my book that's coming. 
Learning to hear again has become a metaphor for me. Like all metaphors, it both signifies and stumbles. It signifies hearing others' voices and my own. Others' cry of injustice and suffering. Learning the lessons of history. It tries to signify psychoanalytic listening, intersubjectivity implanted with prejudice and pre presupp presuppositions. It points to the loneliness involved in hearing loss, both literal and metaphorical. It wants to signify hearing, ethical demand, and responsivity. This is an interesting start to the silences that are happening in the academic world, how people silence each other and people refuse to listen to each other's trauma. But the comparison stumbles because implant training seems much more self-involved than ethical listening can be. First comes the awareness that only privileged first world people have advantages like cochlear implants, crucial as they have become for children born deaf, as well as people of all ages who later become profoundly deaf. In addition, the hours of practice alone on the computer and with audiobooks, even books on the history of slavery and colonialism, scarcely seem intensely relational. On the other hand, perhaps not, hearing loss, like all the vulnerabilities, befalls one. One can be or become characteristically indifferent to the other. We might call this ethical hearing loss or hardness of the heart to switch metaphors. But to lose the capacity to hear or to mourn with others, what is this? Can ethical capacity be gained and lost and regained? We have much to consider. Amazing introduction metaphor. For example, why consider hearing instead of listening? This is one of the big dis distinctions. To listen, surely both a needed skill and perhaps a fine art, also requires lifelong study whether by musicians or psychotherapists. Teaching and learning this skill to a high level belongs to clinical and musical curricula and has been extensively studied in psychoanalysis. It has become ever clearer in theoretical worlds ranging from the classical through the Kleinian to the various intersubjectivities that how the analyst listens determines to a very great extent what can be heard and responded to. So. The reason why we're looking at psychoanalysis here is because psychoanalysis perhaps gives us a chance. And Vygotsky, if you look at my Carl Ratner video, a lot of the anti-American uh, Psychological Association, anti-hive mind pop psychology idioms come from within psychology itself, even though I'm somebody who is crit critical of the whole discipline of psychology for releasing these hive mind idioms into our sociality, these self-fulfilling prophecies. Psychoanalysis and all the also other views within psychology from Vygotsky, from Karl Krauss, people who are critical of Freudian, a strict Freudian perspective, that's very important because Freud himself, you know, not only were the translations wrong, but Freud himself also has these vast scientific assumptions when we've been operating on a hundred years. There's been a hundred years of this kind of all these problems in the scientific method, the replication crisis. <laughs> you know, there's so many problems in the scientific method right now, which are exasperated in the soft social sciences like psychology. Now, the reason why psychology has a specific problem here is because psychology has to de define who is sane and who is not sane, who goes to prison, who goes to the medical asylum, these kinds of decisions are made by psychiatry and psychology. The profession of psychiatry is really problematic by itself, but now I'm more qualified to, because I don't have a medical degree, I'm more qualified to, to critique the discipline of psychology. The, is the issue here is all of my critiques against psychology also really apply to the harder problem of psychiatry too. And there's wars within psychiatry itself. And that's the whole pill shaming against the anti pill shaming movement. So how the analyst listens determines to a very extent what can be heard and responded to. It has also become clear as Chris Janecki explains that the analyst's basic assumptions about how much is involved in what the patient experiences and in everything that happens in analysis determines what can be heard. This is again a Marshall McLuhanist-esque point where the medium 
is the message. Uh, a perspective that just so many people just fail to understand. The, and this is what's going on with a lot of what's going on with the internet culture today. They are disciplining content. And that's what this question of silencing is really all about. Listening and silencing. The analyst, full of one's own suffering, is always there, more or less, self-absorbed towards, turn towards the other. And this is the problem with a lot of psychology is that, yes, the analyst is not necessarily an objective perspective. It never was supposed to be, but he's also involved in his own, in their own healing process as well. Because why does somebody become a psychologist? A lot of the times people become psychologists because they're trying to fix what's going on in their own life, right? I got myself a cognitive behavioral therapy certification because I want to fix what's happening in my own brain, fix what's happening in my own mind. You know, might as well just get the certification rather than just go to a class. My choice to focus on hearing in the face of the extensive literature on listening to be noted here, but not much discussed, intends to focus on the other. Whom do we need to hear and what remains unheard? Listening is my activity. Hearing is my receptivity, my vulnerability, my willingness to be affected by the other. Arguably, the distinction is not so clear and could be drawn differently. And there's a whole literature about this distinction. But my intent here is to place this book within the ethical turn in psychoanalysis. My question, and there's a psychological turn in philosophy, and hopefully there's an ethical turn in psychoanalysis. My question about hearing unheard and silenced voices intends to challenge us to read history, to read the history of our psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic disciplines from unfamiliar angles, to read the history of our co countries from the vantage points of the oppressed. Reading can help us to hear as well as to work as war in Poland often repeats in the service of the other, which is again, completely counterintuitive to the self-serving philosophies of much of leftist theory today. A lot of leftist theory are social reproduction, trying to hold their own institution, their own ideology up. And you can see with all of the gaslighting with regards to all of those words that if I say this channel is gonna be, uh, well, this channel is already throttled. So I'm gonna be slowly moving to rumble as well. I stopped paying for YouTube because it's all bullshit. You can, you can watch my video on football where I basically sum up a lot of the perspectives that I'm talking about and I'm going to be writing about in my Hannah Arendt book. Thus, we will consider that in this book what is meant to learn to hear silenced voices. Pursuing our metaphor, we will think of hearing those silenced as a kind of ethical capacity, a capacity that demands something from us. Resources will come from philosophy, from psychoanalysis, and from history. 30-some years in psychoanalytic practice and supervision have taught me to tune in to what Freud called the unconscious, to voices silenced within ourselves and others by non-responsiveness, by fearing of knowing our, ourselves, by violence of many kinds. It has taught me to notice the ways I am silencing patients or supervises even when trying to help them, complicating their anguished attempts to escape from confusion and unknowing. And the thing is about psychoanalysis and psychology is a lot of the times they base what the, the clinical perspective from kind of the worst case scenario situation. And then from that worst case scenario situation, they give these grand perspectives that are supposed to apply to everybody, but really only should be applied to people in those worst case scenarios. You know, we have these universalisms that, that Karl Krauss actually critiques people like Freud, even with regards to the id, the ego, the superego, or the unconscious, or all of these ideas that are in our everyday lives that have penetrated, have become worse and worse. The pop psychology has become worse and worse over time. You know, in the beginning, it kind of made sense, but as, as it gets passed down and, and repeated over and over again, it gets worse and worse. It's like a photocopier and you get the more rudimentary version over and over. You go to the Freudian analysis, Freud had a lot of complications, had a lot of contradictions within himself. 
but nowadays you have pop psychology idioms on every uh, it's really annoying on every instagram post oh there's some quote from somewhere that's taken out of context that's translated wrong it's just a lot of these things and now with ai you can actually you know i can actually go and look up the quotes that are made from freud or whatever and say oh look Look at this interpretive translation that has pa been passed down over and over again, citation, citation, citation. And you can see the hive mind idioms are within academia itself, which is crazy. It has taught me to notice the ways I am silencing patients or supervising them, even while trying to help them, complicating their anguished attempts to escape from confusion and unknowing. My besser weiser, knowing better attitudes, largely unconscious for me, silence others more often than I want to admit, just as white superiority silences and leaves invisible whom we exclude and dominate. This again, sure, the problem with this is that it's been said so many times, it's one of those hive mind idioms itself. Now we have a sign in Toronto that says white uh, silence is violence, and every day we kind of have to look at this. And you know what? That sign in itself becomes, in a way, the white supremacy symbol of today. White silence is violence. White silence is violence. Look, everybody, who should we praise? Who should we look up to? It becomes, in a way, a reaffirming of that, of the thing that we were trying to combat in the first place. This is why this problems with the hive mind idioms in our social sociality is not at all history. And, and then they say, oh, if you don't talk about it, then blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, there was a, there was a, consciousness to colorblindness. There was a conscious idea of colorblindness. Denzel Washington talks about it. Morgan Freeman talks about it. Those guys had a very, uh, a very long lasting wisdom that develops that kind of colorblindness attitude as opposed to this constant r rumination, this collective rumination that we all have to do. The collective rumination that can go any which way. History, my favorite childhood study joins philosophy and psychoanalysis in this work. We will examine the results of ignorance and disinterest in history, as well as its resources for understanding psychoanalysis and its capacity for transforming ethical consciousness. Now, again, we live in a world where everybody has to bow down to the hive mind idioms before they can actually get published. So everybody has to do that. My last book noted the effects of historical unconsciousness on our capacity to see climate change as the emergence it, emergency it has since become. Unsilencing the voices of Earth and of those most devastating by our warming of the oceans, destruction of essential forests, desertification, and all the rest has become a question of human survival. The threat has become immediate still. We continue as if, continue as if unaffected disassociated and unconscious. I mean, in a way, we don't have a choice. It's, it's a hyper, hyper object. This one example shows how refusal to know history, chattel slavery and settler colonialism, for the crimes against humanity, they continue to be imminently imperils us all. So basically selling her book here as, you know, this idea of she's basically bowing down to the, uh, the, the powers that be right now, the the powers that be that tell us that critical race theory is the only black history that we have, or that this professionalized gaslighting where feminism or is supposed to speak for all women, whatever this feminisms are, these neoliberal carceral feminisms speak for all women, or black history as there being one black history, the, that critical race theory is the only Kind of curriculum that can teach us this when we have people like adolf reed talking about how there is we have people like adolf reed talking about how there is no black monolithic black character that was a creation and it's a it's all this thing about garbage in garbage out in psychology in sociology and all of these that's actually one of those crisis of sciences terms transforming silence this book develops a thesis that someone silences cooperate that some silences cooperate in violence and oppression, often unwittingly, unwitting colonizers, that's my word, while other silences speak an ethical word of response to the other. So that's the second kind of silence. We have to, that's the one that's trying to be cultivated, but 
overall, you know, I'm, I'm making a stronger version of this argument. Overall, it's always, silencing is always cahoots with the dominating system. The second idea of silence is this ethical response to the other. It doesn't work. It's never worked. And that's why we're seeing intersectionality at war with itself. Because they all say it's too much moral, it's too much unpaid emotional labor to listen to the trauma of the people that you disagree with. And this is just such a, it's not an ethical thing, an, an ethical enforcement on the other. It's just a part of the blocking culture. It's part of the polarized echo chamber. And it's part of this culture of platforming straw man and prostitution culture. It normalizes prostitution culture. Prostitution culture in my football video, please watch. Learning to hear means tracing the path from the silence of indifference as if consenting to horror to the vulnerability of silence that silence speaks. So I'm going to skip this and just actually just go through. Chapter one, silence in phenomenology, dream or nightmare. Silence as best is ambiguous. Thomas More in Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons depends on this unclarity to claim that silence does not have the dangerous meaning that Cromwell claims it does. Nor mere void. Silence may protect, deny, attack, or give consent. That's an interesting point. One may be reduced to silence, either by humiliation or out of failure to find the right word. One may be struck silent by art, by holiness, or by outrageousness. Persons or groups may find themselves silent through acts of familial, cultural, or political domination even by violence. Probably every human being has some experience with silence, with silencing others, or has been silenced. David Kleinberg Levine provides an evocative list challenging all explanations. What comes to mind are these, the heavy silence of one doing a deep into their own grief, the silence of one who is unable to unspeakable horror has rendered speechless, the awkward silence of shame or embarrassment, the aggressive silence of one who is hiding his guilt, the, the, benumb, the benumbed silence of a deep depression, the silence of an anger which accuses and causes hurt by using silence as a weapon. That's basically the situation right now. Withholding the kindness of speech, the heroic silence of the political prisoner who refuses to surrender the names of his comrades even under extreme torture, the guarded silence of citizens who must endure constant surveillance under the rule of a police state, the silence of timidity, the silence of shyness, the silence of rapt attention, the silence of prayer, the silence of spellbound anticipation, the silence of joy that needs to be deeply felt. Non-phenomenological accounts of silence can fail to address this array if only indirectly. But what is silence itself? Phenomenology is, of course, ever allergic to univer universalizing definitions and mindful of Wittgenstein's family resemblance will look to descriptions and con contexts. Let us first trace a meandering path through silence in the com company of the phenomenology of Sartre, Ponty, and Levinas. Finally, we'll return to the everyday silences of clinical work to see what phenomenologists might teach working psychoanalysts and vice versa. Pregnant silence. Salt, writing after the war about the resistance, saw silence as heroic act of freedom. Kleinberg Levine's list surely has Salt's Republic of Silence in mind. We never... We were never more free than during the German occupation. We had lost all our rights, beginning with the right to talk. Every day we were insulted to our faces and had to take it in silence. Under one pretext or another, as workers, Jews, or political prisoners, we were deported en masse. Everywhere, on billboards and newspapers, on the screen, we encountered the revolting and insepid picture of ourselves that our oppressors wanted us to accept. And because of this, we were free. Because the Nazi venom seeped even into our thoughts, every accurate thought was a conquest. Because and all powerful police tried to force us to hold our tongues, every word took on value of a declaration of principles. Thus, Sartre teaches us first about the effects of, of violent silencing. He continues 
indicating that keeping silence may also be heroic. All those among us, and what Frenchman was not at one time or another in this situation, who knew any details concerning the resistance, asked themselves anxiously, if they torture me, shall I be able to keep silent? Thus, the basic question of liberty itself was posed, and we were brought to the verge of the deepest knowledge that man can have of himself. It was completely forlorn and unbefriended that they held against torture. Alone and naked in the presence of torturers, clean-shaven, well-fed, and well-clothed, who laughed at their cringing flesh, and to whom an untroubled conscience, with an aboundless sense of social strength, gave every appearance of being in the right alone, without a friendly hand or a word of encouragement. Yet, in the depth of their solitude, it was the others that they were protecting, all the others, all their comrades in resistance. Total responsibility in total solitude. Is this not the very definition of our liberty? That kind of thing is just amazing to read. Villaponti, explicitly addressing Salt, but implicitly speaking to all those who have considered silence a mere lack of noise or the opposite of speech, provides another account in his 1952 Indirect Language and Voices of Silence. Silence speaks in particular through the work of Cezanne or Klee. From depths before and after, under, the, under and between words or music, but intricately involved in them and providing to them layers of meaning, silence can be full, generous, and generative. We should consider speech before it has begun pronounced been pronounced, Merleau-Ponty later wrote, against the ground of silence which precedes it, and without which it would say nothing. When the conductor raises her baton to evoke a Kyrie or the expected notes of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, when a pause follows and an unexpected question, silence creates the breath or ground for music, for painting, or for even language. At the end of a talk, story, or concert, a moment of silence, unpremeditated, may testify to the depths of feeling produced in an audience. When someone has revealed something or shockingly painful, perhaps the loss of a child or a terminal prognosis, a reverent, receptive, compassionate silence must often precede any few words that may be possible. Oh, oh, oh. May be all we can say. Silence may accompany and witness. Merlo Ponty, however, meant to speak of a silence even more inclusive and originary than what his earlier words have suggested to me. In Schelling, before him, he came in his last years to identify silence with nature itself, not contrasted with language, but as its very underpinning. A language, he wrote, sometimes remains a long time pregnant with transformations which are to come, even if only in the form of a gap, a need, or a tendency. In its indirectness, all language is silence. In his recent Mirlo Ponti and the Face of the World, Glenn Mazzies places silence at the center of Ponti's early account of perception, as well as his mature work on chaiism and inter interwining intertwining silence becomes the invisible source of the visible not a literal silence it occurs in painting in music in poetry expressive and lyrical it gives sense to the sensible but this silence can be corrupted we can avoid it but only at our peril long before computers and the internet dominated our lives mirlo ponty warned of reduced thinking to data collecting in the name of silence we then test, operate, and transform the data. In this way, he wrote, we enter into a cultural regimen in which there is neither truth nor falsity concerning man and history into a sleep or nightmare from which there is no awakening. That is a reference to James Joyce. James Joyce reference. Like Hegel's night in which all cows are black, we have entered the postmodern era of Mirlo ponty did not live to see but which he surely described. Our headless, long rush into big data world comes with the loss of connection to what Mirlo Ponty in his 1952 essay would have called the voices of silence. 
as Mazis repeatedly points out. Of course, such concern about deadening effects of technical rationality have been common among phenomenologists, from Edward Husserl and including Heidegger, whose critique in its original form unfortunately included a far too casual reference to the production of corpses in concentration camps, as if nothing had been made at stake has been at stake. Farming is now motorized food industry, in essence, the same as the fabrication of corpses in gas chambers and extermination camps, the same as blockaded and starving of the peasantry, the same as the fabrication of the hydrogen bomb. Oof. It's really interesting to read Heidegger after the black books. Mirlo-Ponty takes a very different path, linking cybernetics to the loss of the world's silent and speaking wholeness. Right now you're listening, I'm cutting up everything. I'm cutting up all the silences because I want you to... <laughs> Listen to this fast and quick because it's the fast and quick world that we live in. But likewise, worried that a reductive data focus would lead to a disastrous consequence. He might not be surprised by our climatic climate catastrophe when we lose the sense of shuddering and shivering as silence comes to speech. We may also lose our reverence for our the world, for the nature that we are the state of constant mourning as a combating of this. Phenomenology, Bernard Doenhauer has considered silence as a phenomenon. He first described two types. First, intervening silence that punctuates speech. Second, anticipatory and afterward silences, expectant and haunting. Third type is a deep silence links him to Merleau-Ponty through, though he means perhaps something more recognizable, as he often, as he speaks of the silence of intimate contact or liturgical silence and of the silence of the to be said. This last transcends all saying, but he relates it with Dodimer to tact and inexpressibility, incomprehensibility, incommensurability, Dauenhauer provides such examples as Shakespeare's Richard, Richard's refusal to answer his victims before their execution. Zen gardens in Kyoto provide me another example. Threatening silences. Phenomenologists have spent less time describing silences than that menace, but the disadvantage of the world know them well. No less pregnant than those Merleau-Ponty described in his many writings about painting, or that Wittgenstein might have included in his showing as contrasted with saying. These have quite another feel. In the natural world, we speak of the calm before the storm. Patients tell their analysis of parents whose silences were worse than beatings or tirades. Border agents refuse to tell children what has happened to the parents for whom they have been violently separated. People historically exclude did from being counted as human, whether skin, gender, sexual orientation, or whatever, known for the silence concerning their stories, wipes out their history and threatens their further signification. Black Lives Matter protests such menacing silence. Psychoanalysts who fear gratifying may refuse important words of acknowledgement or welcoming. Naming can be murder, but so can the refusal to name. Fanon, psychiatrist and phenomenologist, describe in detail the ways that speaking out of silence assumptions shape the experiences of blacks and those suffering under colonial regimes. He had sat in Mirlo Ponti's courses, but for him, the silence was dangerous. The view or gaze that whites directed towards blacks and Arabs, he understood, infected their experiences of themselves. Only by recontextualizing their experience, a revolutionary idea could colonize or enslaved people gain any ground of their own. Diagnosing them as insane. <laughs> <coughs> diagnosing them as insane or as inherently defective silenced their own voices and made them invisible. Fanon psychiatric work, Fanon Gibson assumption, Fanon psychiatric work, 
challenge the colonialist thinking and practices behind the psychiatric hospital and gave the silences voices, silenced voices. Later chapters will consider silences and disassociation surrounding chattel slavery, violence, settler colonialism. Fanon also spoke into these silences and into presumptions making them possible. Phenomenological epoch remains unavailable to help here, as Fanon clearly saw, because that whites cannot perceive their assumptions that would require bracketing. Trauma for frozen silences. Another distant step from Merleau-Ponty's silence of mute radiance, we find the silences involved in traumatic experience. We can distinguish perhaps the silence of anticipation, that of abandonment, and the failure of witness, where silence itself becomes a trauma nachturaklik, under, understood backwards, as assuming as understanding of psychological trauma as shockingly disorganizing experience that leaves a person disoriented in time and distrustful of self and others. We may be tempted to think of noisy violence of school shootings or atomic bombs of rape. Even though these images are often accurate, the silence before, during, and after them rarely receives phenomenological due. It's if phenomenologist Levinas could write, his entire life had been shaped by the anticipation and memory of Nazi horror. No wonder he wrote in the post-war years of insomnia, of the noisy and ominous silence of the Ilya. There is always portending violence yet demanding response. The entire opening of consciousness would already be a turning towards the something over which wakefulness watches. It's necessary however, to think an opening that is prior to intentionality, a primordial opening that is an impossibility of hiding, one that is an, one that is an assignation, an impossibility of hiding in oneself. This opening is insomnia from Levinas. Like single-sided deaf people who suffer from tinnitus, the, the traumatized hearing here Rumbling noises reminding them that the worst can happen and that all can be lost. Many, of course, scream into the night at the all too present realities in their nightmares. In the daytime, they may be mute, but this rumbling insomnia can also be open towards the ethical. This rumbling insomnia can also be open towards the ethical. It reminds me of Nietzsche's desert, where in Nietzsche's desert, you can go either which way. The person standing on the edge of a cliff about to jump off somebody can push them in one direction or they can easily be pushed in the other direction so we should not expect that levinas endorsed either soft's heroic post-war conception of silence or ponty's mystical quasi-romantic schellingian idea for him silence gives consent to violence and refuses responsibility from the immediate work on his return to Paris after liberation, Parole et Silence, Silence, to his magnum opus, otherwise than being, he insisted on the ethical speaking that does not allow either perpetrators or bystanders to hide from responsibility. Trauma therapists and students of extreme disassociative conditions have, I believe, provided important questions to phenomenology about which philosophers have until now been un all too willing to keep silence. What kind of silence fails to speak of climate catastrophe, threatening to make further speech on this subject degenerate into a hopeless wail? What kind of silence keeps me from greeting the miserable homeless person on the street asking me for a euro or a dollar? A lot of the times, you just acknowledging the homeless person is just half, probably more than worth more than the dollar itself. What kind of silence keeps me from asking what part of my own ancestors had in support in slavery or in the colonizing of the so-called terra nullis, empty land whose inhabitants did not count as people, so that indigenous peoples were slaughtered or disastrously, disastrously reduced? How did these people become nobody for me so that I cannot even speak their names or their languages? How does a person or a group become reduced to silence? And what about silence as the refusal out of the fear or out of the cowardice to witness 
Injustice, and Atrocity. Showa producer Cla Claude Lansman speaks of a conspiracy of silence. There are some good ways of being silenced, there are some good ways, and there are some very bad ways as well. As well. To talk too much about the Holocaust is a way of being silent, a bad way. To talk too much about the Holocaust is a way of being silent, a bad way of being silent. That's the book uh, that I'm, I'm referring to. Uh, Karuth is the one who wrote the book uh, Violence is Not Abuse. Or what's the book? Um, Conflict is Not Abuse. Karuth. Or, he does not explain clearly, but he sides with Merleau-Ponty in refusing to oppose speech in silence. Apparently, speech itself can obfuscate historical realities, can minimize, can silence the sufferer of atrocity. Best example ever, the woman king. Historical revisionism gone totally awry. Silence in the phenomenology of Emmanuel Levinas. These people can't say it, what I'm saying, because these people are all established and they can't go out there and say whatever <laughs> the, the full force of the argument that I'm saying here. But I can, because I'm already cancelled. I was cancelled because I was in between two groups of feminists as a male feminist telling each other that they should listen to each other's trauma, that they should hear each other's trauma, whatever distinction you want, a philosophical distinction you want to make. Okay, Both groups saying it's too much emotional, unpaid emotional labor to listen to the trauma of the other group. And you can see all of that is imploding right now. Intersectionality is imploding right now. Silence in the phenomenology of Levinas. Like Salt and Ponty, Levinas, whose insomnia we noted earlier, lived before and after the occupation in Paris, but unlike them, spent the five war years in captivity in a labor camp near Hanover, where as a French officer he survived, but where the Jewish captives were segregated and much more harshly treated. It's interesting. I thought he's Jewish himself, right? Not for Jews was the genial university in the camp, the reality described by fellow phenomenologist Paul Ricoeur. Levinas wrote, There were 70 of us in a forestry commando unit for Jewish prisoners of war in Nazi Germany, but the other men, called free, who had dealings with us or gave us work or orders or even a smile, and the children and women who passed by and sometimes raised their eyes, stripped us of our human skin. We were subhuman, a gang of apes, a small inner murmur, the strength and wretchedness of persecuted people reminded us of our essence as thinking creatures, but we were no longer part of the world. Our comings and goings, and this, I'm saying part of the world, I'm thinking of Heidegger, being in the world, Heidegger, our coming and going, our sorrowfulness and our laughter, illness and distracted, distractions, the work of our hands and anguish of our eyes, the letters we received from France and who's accepted for our families, all that passed in parentheses, bracketing, the phenomenological bracketing. We were beings entrapped in their species, despite all their vocabularies, beings without language. Racism is not a biological concept. Anti-Semitism is the archetype of all internment. It shuts people away in a class, in a box, in a category, deprives them of expression, condemns them of being signifiers without a signified. How can we deliver a message about our humanity, which, from behind the bars of quotation marks, will come across as anything other than monkey talk? I think this is all a real response to the empty chatter of Heidegger, all these Heideggerian words. This is why it's so important to read Levinas. And then about halfway through our longevity, longevity sorry, our our long captivity for a few short weeks before the sentinels chased him away, a wandering dog entered our lives. One day, he came to meet this rabble as we returned under guard from work. He survived in some wild patch in the region of the camp, but we called him Bobby, an exotic name, as one does with a cherished dog. He would appear at morning assembly and was waiting for us as we were returned, jumping up and down and barking in delight. For him, there was no doubt that we were men. This dog was the last Kantian in Nazi Germany, without the brain needed to universalize maxims and drives. And that's what Adorno's, I, I keep talking about Adorno's critique of Kant. When you universalize 
your suicidalness. <laughs> that's basically the what the Reich was. Third Reich. Not good to say Third Reich because that's agreeing with their historiography, with their historicism. And this is what's crazy about the historical revisionism today. It's just armed all the other types of historical revisionism because we had Cleopatra and Woman King and all these historically inaccurate details or retellings based on the critical race theory perspective of the of the monolithic black person that's very much American. That's just universalized towards the whole world. Same with feminism, a universalized woman. And now we can see that this kind of what's called the woman uh, woman mask. Right? We had the black mask and now people are pretending. They have a, an archetype of what a woman is and they and they pretend to be a woman. And it's just it's just kind of right? that's why I'm all about the bulge. Many have written about this passage, but here I want to ask what it tells the phenomenologists about silencing and affirming or negating human dignity. To speak means more than to bark out words. Here there is no why. From the guards to desperately thirst guard to desperately thirsty Primo Levi, who asks why his small icicle has been swatted away. Here there is no why. Shema. This is a one thing that you see in in china i've lived in china for a couple of years you ask a lot of questions there is always buwe shema buwe shema there is no why it's part of the cultural hive mind idioms you ask about the camps and they say either i don't know about it or it doesn't exist and they say that in the same sentence i don't know about it and it doesn't exist to, to the other to speak to the other may mean a joyful or thoughtful greeting from a companion animal or from someone who cannot speak my language. It may mean recognizing without words that a sufferer is a fellow human who should never be so mistreated. Colleagues who work daily with victims of torture must listen and listen to the unspeakable, bearing witness to the humanity of the other. Ironically, our silent horror at what has been done to these fellow humans begins to undo their tortured silencing, if only a little. This silence trembles on both sides, silence unfrozen. To unfreeze traumatic silences, speaking becomes necessary. Whatever the exact text, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, or Never Again, among many, this ethical speaking, sometimes trivialized, of course, insists that silence and persecuted and murder ones are human and that injustice to them requires active response. Now, just talking about that, you know, one of the things about this platforming straw man culture, an example of it is, for example, Rumi. Rumi is seen as a very, you know, amazing scholar. But when you look at history, what's actually happened is Rumi's teacher, Shams, Shams of Tabriz, he, he was silenced. The reason why he was silenced is so that everybody pays attention to Rumi. Two more examples. The Reagan files came at the same time as the indictment of Trump. The Reagan files saying that Reagan sold out American democracy to Iran for the, because of the Carter election, holding out the hostage situations so that he could win the election, selling out American democracy. That was said at the same time as the Trump thing. So that everybody's focusing on Trump. Nobody even cares about the Reagan thing anymore. Another example, Epstein versus the Me Too guy. Right? The Me Too guy, the guy who I, I can't even remember his name. The ugly dude. But Epstein was the real one. And look at how Epstein was the one we should have been focusing on. And look what happened. Indifference by those who profit from the continued silence, who live in the houses stolen from the deported and murdered Jews of Europe or from Palestine, for example, on the land stolen from indigenous people, deepens the trauma and further isolates those traumatized. Psychoanalysis, the talking cure, has long known that speaking the unspeakable in the right context can restore, if not cure, traumatized people. Voices from the classical tradition, even after the shameful banishment of Sandor Ferenzi, have spoken for the soul murdered and for those nearly destroyed by historical atrocity, Adler, 1995. Relational psychoanalysis has begun to consider relational trauma, especially the self-states it may lead us to disavow. Intersubjective system theorists 
Arnold and Stolro have brought trauma in development and adulthood in the center of their phenomenological account of pathogenesis and psychoanalytic process. The shattered experiential world of the traumatized becomes a psychotic state to find connection and understanding by a therapist or analyst who is a brother or a sister in the, words, uh, in the worlds of trauma. Often, as Davoin and Godelier write from European perspective, that's great that she says that, the patient's madness finds the analyst's history and connects to undo the wretched silencing. Attempting to undo silencing, psych, psych, attempting to undo silencing psychoanalytically often runs directly into shame. Shame built into the most traumatic experience with its inherent degrading and dehumanizing qualities does not add to trauma or constitute a defense against awareness of it. Instead, it pre-reflectively disempowers and disentangles the potential speaker. What right have I, so much below any ladder or scale, to speak of mistreatment or injustice done to me? The traumatized person, humiliated in many ways, not always evident, has been preemptively silenced by the resulting shame. Now, this kind of shame, I, you know, shame is supposed to also give us, that kind of shame is for the people that are traumatized. Again, that kind of talk of shame is for already the people who are already in the disordered world. For people who have healed, for people who have subjectivity, shame works in a completely opposite manner. Shame, shame works as, as a question of, do I belong here? Should I speak right now? All of those ethical questions are brought to us by shame. And we live in a shameless society because the traumatized are the ones who are given the most voice. And their perspective of what is healthy, you know, the traumatized perspective of healing, is supposed to be a panacea for all of us. When really, shame can work in a positive direction as well. Again, that's the problem with focusing on people who are overly burdened with clinical clinical work instead of philosophy. That's why we always need to have philosophy in response. Okay, so she's talking about the trauma here. Why did I not fight off my rapist? Why did I not work harder in the face of the school's rejection of me? Why could I not keep silent after days or weeks of torture? All these questions and more disqualified the traumatized from speaking and from being heard and re-included in the human community. In human community. I like how she doesn't say a human community or the human community, just in human community. Now, that's why I think just as we have a distinction between listening and hearing, we should have different types of distinctions between shame. Shamed silence may also result from community's ref refusal of witness to mass injustice. Consider, for example, the desperate plight of those psychoanalysts who fled Germany and Austria in the 30s only to find that many of their colleagues did not want them, either because they feared competition or because of anti-Semitism. Already terrified and alone, often without the language skills they needed and without the medical credentials to practice in the U.S., they and their families faced rejections in Britain and U.S., as well as the terrible losses in Europe. Their traumatic experiences has shaped the learning of us who have been their students, but has almost never been spoken or written about until recently. We have inherited the fruits of bystandership, reminding me of the words of Emmanuel Levinas speaking of Heidegger's silence as if consenting to horror, silence as complicity. Philip Cushman has written the work on ethics and psychology and torture that I would have wanted to write. Isn't it amazing that right now I'm writing the book about Arendt and I realize that there's so many other writers that have basically already written what I wanted to write the thing that I wanted to write. So I have to maneuver in a way that is novel. I don't want to waste people's time. That's the opposite of publisher die culture. Psychology and torture that I would have wanted to write without a thoroughness that never masks his commanding prophetic voice, reminding me of those originals who made me shudder and cower in shame, reading Abraham Herschel's The, the Prophets, calling us psychologists to account for our semi-deliberate moral unconsciousness. Cushman holds us responsible, rightly in my view, for the evils our neglect 
of ethical education as well as our thoughtlessness, individualism, consumer capitalism, neoliberalism, scientism, amazing, all the things I'm critiquing, individualism, consumer capitalism, neoliberalism, scientism. And I think neoliberalism and scientism are really much closer than, all these things are much closer to each other than we can really talk about. Rot in our name, our name, in, I guess in terms of psychology, scientists, academia. I share this trenchant critique of these ideologies and attitudes precisely and thus will not repeat them. My own reflections leaning towards the psychoanalytic imply a reference to a prophetic character hidden in the psycho psychoanalytic tradition, indeed, in the whole psychoanalytic tradition. Of course, I realize that Cushman's works in Deitzby, along with all our colleagues, that the deep and thick ethical failures he explains in torture contexts are running, as he says, like a fault line be below our professional community. Wow. To have a, I mean, uh, to have psychologists start with you know, the limitations of their work, they don't even do that anymore. Like a fault line below our professional communities, preventing us from responding adequately to the current crises, leaving us befuddled and confused in ways that he describes, polluting the work we pursue with good intentions. His prophetic warning is more than, ar than urgent. Like Cushman's, my concerns intersect at the crossroads of philosophy, philosophical hermeneutics, and ethics. History, including psychoanalytic history and his histories of settler colonialism and chattel slavery, climate science, and psychoanalysis, not for a moment to minimize the importance of all humanistic psychotherapies, it seems important to notice the ways in which psychoanalytic theory may have obfuscated ethical concerns. Just as Cushman illuminates in psychology, the psych psi disciplines generally, the psychiatry is the most. Though I particularly want to honor those psychologists and psychoanalysts who have led the fight to expose and to end the involvement of psychologists in the U.S. torture program, we must grant that most of us are were silent. They remain silent. Look at surveillance capitalism. Who is helping all of these people make clicking and liking and like and subscribe YouTube videos? These are all psychological theories that have gotten us addicted to cigarettes. And even now, in adequately horrified by the acts done in our name, I am reminded in the infamous Goring Institute of Psychoanalysis in Berlin during the Third Reich, as well as those doctors I met in Heidelberg, who no longer even call themselves psychiatrists, now it is the faculty of psychosomatics, because of the atrocities their professions had committed in those years. All of these words... Critical psychology, psychosomatics, they're just trying to get out of their own profession. Whereas the people in the profession, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatry Association, they have blood on their hands for the history. And not even the history, what's happening right now? Look at all the boys in prison just drugged up because of these atrocities their profession had committed. In those years, in those years, yeah, silence is still continuing. That's great. Lifton should surely be background reading here freud's concern with the unconscious motivation has not helped enough in his time or ours to challenge organized crime against humanity to challenge organized crimes against humanity we're talking about real organized crime the state sanctioned organization of the of of crimes against humanity which is continuing today which people are being silenced for this is why I'm reading this book. This is why I'm writing them. Where and a lot of these progressive ideas are used to justify it. So even even her, even Madame Orange's, you know, bending down in the beginning of the book, she has to do it. Where is our commensurate shame? Perhaps am I missing Cushman's point? But I am not sure. Now she comes back to shame in a positive sense, I guess. Perhaps I am missing. This is why I'm so one one way about things, because the whole system is the other way. Everybody's talking about shame in that way, so I have to work on shame in the other direction. Because the whole fucking hive mind idioms talks about shames in one way. Pill shaming, slut shaming, all of this stuff. Perhaps I am missing Cushman's point, but I am not sure. Perhaps the same moral fault lines made up of individualism, scientism, and Irvin Hoffman's masterfully described double thinking leading us to a moral fog and evasion, now keeping us underreacting to the support organized psychology gave 
George W. Bush torture program. That's the most intense version of this. But you don't have to be so intense. Just look at the everyday prison psychiatry. Everyday prison psychology. We don't have to go to Guantanamo. And now threatens to resume. All that is needed for evil to prevail is good for good people to do nothing, according to the, uh, the big hive mind Edmund Burke. Uh, idiom from Edmund Burke. Cushman explains how the deep structure of psychological professions almost never examined and brought into dialogue makes it, it almost impossible to generate the kind of ethical deliberation that might have been put that have, might have put on the brakes or activated the good people. But given that our deep assumptive structures continue questioned by most, what other horrors may we be supporting or overlooking? Great question. From the APA to the CIA, intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism. Our colleagues of color could tell us that the answer, if we would give them five minutes, would gump. So, we, so could the millions of climate refugees. This is why there's more philosophy happening and Wendy's and prison cells than the academia today. That's why the true psychologists of our society are service workers working at McDonald's dealing with fucking crazy people that are coming to buy burgers than the psychologists getting paid $100,000 a year to uh, deal with people who have um, already workers comp, you know, for therapy sessions. People who want to heal versus people who are completely in the tornado of, of the traumatized mind. Who has to deal with that? Not actual psychologists. <laughs> so Cushman's prophetic demand to consider our sins of individualistic and consumerist mindlessness. Warren Poland likes to define the unconscious as what we do not want to know about ourselves. That's very good also constitutes a call to psychoanalysis, to meaning and dialogue-oriented psychotherapy, to a kind of human and ethical work never to be double-thought into a STEM discipline. Unfortunately, just as Cushman suggests, we contemporary psychoanalysts, like our grandparents, who excluded humanistic and ethical voices like Eric Fromm, Eric Erickson, and John Bowdley, lean perhaps unintentionally, or even Freud himself, perhaps unintentionally towards ethical ambiguity. Some advocates of multiple self-states asked who is responsible for voting in their name in elections. Fall silent. No one is responsible when everyone is standing in the spaces. I do it myself, living intricately implicated in an extreme capitalist system that systematically destroys millions of innocent human lives. I don't think capitalism destroys human lives. It destroys human minds. Capitalism keeps you alive on life support. The planet that could support them, or actually who, who are in the capitalist system, the pro and the, it kills everybody else, I guess. The autonomous ego of ego psychology was, of course, too simple to describe complex relational emergence of self-relation, self-experience, but the development and relationally described ego of Hans Lowald, for example, appropriated from the parents its moral responsibility. We don't have to say id, ego, super ego. The, another translation was I, it, and the over me. Id, ego, super ego, everybody knows it now. Why? Is it objective truth? We could make it much more simple. We could use a lot more other translations. We could critique Freud, Karl Krauss's position, for example. Without a theory and practice of ethical selfhood, I believe we cannot expect psychoanalysis to lead the psi disciplines in creating moral dialogues, even protests to resist ethical fogs and ambiguities like that permitted us to stand while psychologists participate in torture in our names. If we theorize away the possibility of integrity and responsibility, we are lost. Haven't we already done that? It's too much unpaid emotional labor to educate you. Pretending to be a hard science will not solve our problem. Yeah, because there's <laughs> years of this circle spinning. This circle spinning. I'm going to show that circle to you. The STEM discipline, as in our omnipresent devices, everything functions by rules. If the rules are properly formulated, everything runs out just fine. Bending the rules will cause crashes. Even malware runs by the rules. <laughs> showing us that the rules are indeed value-free. In our human sciences, trying to be STEM sciences, though, and here I recommend Catherine Barard, though we intend, we tend to ignore those ethical problems that cause crashes in human relationships, that reduce human beings to things, objects, 
all these people talking about object objectification are the ones that are objectifying us. They're the ones that are transforming our lives into constant intersectional cost-benefit analysis of emotional labor and privilege. It's objectifying character. How do you judge a person? By their class. In Cushman's elegant and horrifying, and then not only just judging that person, but moralizing that judgment as well. That's the crazy part. In Cushman's elegant and horrifying language, how did we allow these series of betrayals, humiliations, and sadistic acts to be thought of as subject of legal debate? That's why I wouldn't care about psychology and psychiatry if it wasn't a legal debate, instead of recognizing it as, as an ethical scandal. Torture, exactly. Torture is the strongest argument here. An utterly reprehensible act, unjustifiable both ethically and practically. Yet, who was getting the legalistic and procedural and STEM justifications? It's a betrayal that wounds the very soul of the prisoner, degrades the perpetra perpetrator, and undermines the moral integrity of a society that is responsible for it. Psychiatrists pushing pills in prison. I do something that will make you feel better. Hey, do you want this? It'll make you feel better. They say that. Different psychiatrists, not just one psychiatrist. That's part of the practice. It starkly illuminates, and psychologists sending them to the psychiatrist. It starkly illuminates what must be considered the most egregious of our human mistakes. Treating fellow humans as things to be used, not for precious lives to be cherished and honored. This is a Western worldview. A Western worldview developed, this is a point of view, <laughs> out of the tradition of the West that we came to humanism, are doing away with, with our postmodern justification. It is the graphic and perhaps most extreme enactment of an instrumental relationship, one that strikes at the very core of human ex social existence by its objecti objectification of the other and its denial of the limits of one's own understanding. It is part that the Hebrew prophets meant by idolatry. Great. Now we can get the Muslims on our side and all the people who are anti-idolatry as well. Although part of me, uh, theologically, I, I kind of like the, the rituals around idol idolatry. It can be more complicated than that. But yes, the process by which humans first uncritically admire and worship inanimate and human-made creations such as wealth. Automobiles, social status, national emblems, demagogic behavior, and by doing so, are themselves turned into things. The people who are objectifying are the ones who are things themselves. A march of instrumentalization, a march of objectification supported by hive mind idioms. No one who remembers Jean Amory's description of the first time he was tortured could claim that Cushman exaggerates. Again, I, I, I don't make any comments about torture because I just can't. It's awe. It's an awe-inspiring for me. It's, it causes silence for me. It's traumatic. Amory, and so I, I, gave, I talk about what I know and what I know, only what I know. I don't talk about the extremes. She, as a clinical psychologist, clinical psychoanalyst, would know. But Amory preceded his story with a quotation from British novelist Graham Greene, who commented on photography photographs of Viet Cong torture emerging in the American and British press at the same time. The strange new feature about the photographs of torture now appearing in the British and American press is that they have been taken with the approval of the torturers and are published over captions that contain no hint of condemnation. They might have come out of a book on insect life. Does this mean that the American authorities sanction torture as a means of interrogation? The photographs certainly are a mark of honesty, a sign that the authorities do not shut their eyes to what is going on. I wonder if this kind of honesty without conscience is really to be preferred over the old hypocrisy. Think about, again, we are constantly told white silence is violence, patriarchy, all this stuff that you know everyone has to bend down to over and over and over and over and over. Constant rumination, constant collective rumination. Perhaps the old colorblind hypocrisy was better. That's my point as well. Amory commented, the admission of torture, the boldness, but is it still that of coming forward with such photos is excl explicable only if it is assumed that a revolt of public conscience is no longer to be feared? So these questions possible and actual long before the George W. Bush administration make it clear that the climate 
for shoulder shrugging in the U.S. and in psychology cultures was fertile soil, with little opposition to be expected after 9-11, and psychoanalysis with a stronger intellectual tradition could do no better. But ethical scandals can tend not to be the topics of our training conferences or journals. Of course not. Not only do we fail to learn the hermeneutic dialogue necessary to consider ethical questions in depth and confront their meaning. I mean, I ask these kinds of ethical questions to psychologists all the time, and they give me hide mind answers. I'm everywhere else. I'm talking about just the everyday psychologist, not this kind of deep. But when breaches of this magnitude do occur, Note my minimizing, anonymizing language. We do not immediately devote our text, our next national or intent international conference to them. A few concerned souls may offer one panel, probably not even a complicity studies. That's why we need a complicity studies. We do not, for the most part, engage in a collective soul searching, asking about how we could have been complicit in so much evil or even... What exactly is wrong with torture? <laughs> What's wrong with our discipline? What's wrong with the discipline of psychology? You're not even allowed to ask that question. It's a banned question. It's a banning of the banning. And yet, why should we be surprised when famous psychoanalysts have committed e egregious sexual boundary violations, sometimes even leading to the loss of professional licenses, institutions that have protected them despite widespread knowledge as if the offender's privacy were more important than our duty to protect the patients and trainees? Sometimes senior colleagues even invited the offender to social gatherings and continue to teach his papers and books, as if to say the trainees that respecting and protecting patients does not matter. Wink, wink, nod, nod. I think that we should even even more read those kinds of books. I mean, you do it with Heidegger, no, didn't you? And shoot someone on, he or she is one of us. He could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and no one would object. Our senior colleagues may blame the patient. And you can see Trump is gaining in the polls. <laughs> oh man, another four years of psychological torture that's going to be. Oof. Our, or senior colleagues may blame the patients to training committees or licensing boards. No way, licensing boards. Of course, the offender cannot then explain to self or others why the transgression was wrong. Or why the boundary is a boundary. Not to mention the confusion of tongues, debilitating shame resulting for the patient or the trainee. Our collective failure to engage in ongoing ethical dialogues in our training institutes, journals, and conferences stem from the scientism that Cushman and Hoffman describes it describes and reinforces it. The neoliberal scientism spread by neoliberal hive mind idiom, included idioms that Donna Orange was also utilizing boundaries. Discussion about the ethics usually comes down to making the rules ever more precise. I have recently seen the draft of a psychoanalytical institute 20 page ethics code, which does not attempt to be a statement of both values and rules, which does attempt to be a statement of both values and, and rules. Look, we have to be constant of our hive mind idioms constantly. Okay, every time I utilize one, every time I see one, every, one, every time I can recognize the reference, I say it. That's the first step towards ethics here. I don't, I don't have any expectations of these old writers that have been in the profession for years. I mean, all her books are pretty good. But she's also still part of it, as she says herself. We keep hoping that precision in our rules will rescue us from needing to engage in moral discourse and moral reasoning. So... This is the what we're talking about, precision in our rules, and then you also use that. Boundary is a boundary. These are container words, container words or hive mind idioms. But we must break the silence and resort to genuine education. Break the silence idiom. The absence of philosophically learned moral discourse in the profession leads to a thin, easily manipulated relation with ethics exactly no psychologists and few psychoanalysts are rigorously cha trained psychology i've spoken to a prison psychologist that didn't know who who didn't know who kafka was without practice kafka how kafka-esque is that if you're a prison psychologist who doesn't know who kafka is without practice in such ethical dialogue leading to practical wisdom we are like people who need to learn to swim when already drowning. <laughs> She's drowning right now. She's recognizing it. With only rules to guide us, we become experts at bending them as Cushman writes. To summarize my first thought, I believe we should heed Cushman's call to take ourselves seriously as an alternative to the valueless, foggy, procedural 
the reductive liquid modernity discourse of postmodernity by Bauman. We hermeneutics in psychology and psychoanalysis can speak up for racial justice, climate justice, ethical treatment of patients, opposition to torture, for example. We invite those who think psychotherapy concerns more than techniques and technologies, and especially those who think it probably concerns something else entirely, to talk ethics with us. Perhaps our conversations and ethical worries will bleed out into the larger cultures where they are so urgently needed. But that's the problem. The <laughs> bleeding out into larger cultures where they are so urgently needed. That's the problem. No, we need to separate the personal from the political. There needs to be a space in the university for conversation. A safe space for freedom of speech. <laughs> My second thought concerns the reading of history as an ethical project. To be further developed into a later chapter, scientific scientists' approach to psychology, psychotherapy, and worst of all to psychoanalysis lose track of the old dictum that those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it, and those who do not study hive mind idioms are also doomed to repeat it. A good reason to read Hoffman's report, Cushman's article, and the writing of those closely familiar with this awful story, but worst, by not studying history, including this history, we are already repeating. We continue the fog, the obfuscation, bad things happen, and the evasions. Somebody else did it. Far away. Chattel slavery. Settler colonialism? Somebody else did it. Long ago. And yet, just last summer, wanting to know more about the history of Maine, where I usually spend the summers, and looking to Wikipedia as the handiest resource, <laughs> I learned that Maine's... I learned in quotation, that Maine's history began with the French and the British, surrounded by names like Penobopscot and Kennebecay and Passagakaway, Passawakake, and have read Wendy Warren's New England Bound, Slavery and Colonization in the New World, I remember that the early colonists from Massachusetts had sent others to Maine to take the land and eliminate those few indigenous people who had survived the plagues already brought from Europe. The beauty of Maine hides a brutal, criminal history of over-entitled Europeans appropriating communally held land in the name of religion, but for economic gain. In the name of religion, but for economic gain. That was their religion. Only a few of its original people remain protected to and honor their Penobscot Banaki cultures. If we look beyond the surface of history we have been taught to prepare ourselves for moral questioning, especially the history that is saying, <laughs> the historicism that's saying that this is the moral history, even beyond that. Thus, I believe that each of us must study some aspects of history of mo moral oppression and crimes if we are able to develop the need the sensitivities to stop repeating. If you haven't read about slavery, if you haven't weeped about intergenerational rape, we already know that this in families because my nine siblings and I talk about the conditions of our past it has become possible for one of my youngest sisters to write a statement to be read at her funeral no one in our generation ever beat their children repeating can be stopped usually through dialogic examination of what went wrong and what it all means both individually and culturally lynching and its more recent imitators like mass incarceration stops only if we study its history and attitude, consciousness, conscious and unconscious, expressing. Psychoanalytic devotion to this type of understanding means protecting our precious dialogic legacy from the threat of double thinking and from the physics psychics envy. <laughs> In search of scientific legitimacy, we lose the betray and betray the most precious gift we have to offer our patients and the larger world. We also refuse ethical responsibility. This brings me to, and this is a lot of these people who are pushing the pill shaming thing, stop pill shaming thing, are like, this is science, so much scientism. This brings me to my last point, that Miranda warning, you have the right to remain silent. Yes. When I am being approached by law enforcement as if were I were a criminal, this precious right may save me. Still, it cannot become my fundamental life organizing principle. When you are starving, falling, being mistreated, being tortured, 
I may not remain silent. Now we have crossed over from law into ethics. How did we allow this series of betrayals, humiliations, and sadistic acts to be thought of as a subject of legal debate instead of recognizing it as an ethical scandal? The difference between parsing out legal distinctions, important as they may be, and responding ethically corresponds to the difference between machine-like rule following and protecting the vulnerable other, whose fate, directly or indirectly, may be in my hands, learning over and over the relational and difference between law and morality requires conversation about such matters from childhood through graduate school and professional education to the end of life. Reading books like lawyers, Brian Stevenson's Just Mercy helps us understand that laws can be seriously unjust and that, as he often repeats, each person is better than the worst thing he or she has ever done. No moral calculus here, no calculus here, but an ethical conversation about justice beyond law. Reading history to return to my earlier point stretches our moral responsibilities to include people whom we might not otherwise notice or include in our concerns. We must be responsible for that which we deem ourselves not responsible for. In the face of gross injustices all around us in which we participate pervasively, we do not have the right to remain silent. We psychologists and psychoanalysts are citizens, not subjects, and fellow human beings. Philip Cushman has now spoken out, challenging the most fundamental attitude and assumptions of our, in our professions, breaking our silence on behalf of those who cannot speak for themselves. Who will be next? In conclusion, belatedly, we are learning to hear. Too late. Philosophy, Mirlo Parthi wrote in his last work, the visible and invisible is the re-conversation of silence and speech into one another. Finding words for the unspeakably beautiful and the unspeakably horrible, inadequate as those words will always be, even perhaps so poetic words, philosophy does only half of its job. In the other hand, we lapse back into silence, whereof we cannot speak, whereof we must remain silent. Silent before that which demands reverence. Silence before that which exceeds words either by way of sublimity to, or horror. Look at how she does a land acknowledgement here, an authentic land acknowledgement. The artist faces the same problem as the philosopher. On the wall of Beethoven's house in Stats are Kant words, the st starry heavens above and the moral law within. In this very house where Beethoven wrote his heartwarming Heiligenstadt testament expressing his suicidal thoughts over his encroaching deafness and also wrote some of his greatest music, he faced the problem of silence. To break it, he wrote music. To accept silence, he walks in the field. And now we can see that Dali's work is being shown in Toronto, even though he was a straight-up fascist. <laughs> We're talking about all these people we shouldn't read. But Dali was a straight-up fascist. What do you think that mustache was? That mustache was an ode. So a phenomenology of silence arrives at no definition, but finds an omnipresent feature of human life that punctuates and pervades it under the and beyond all the noise silence also threatens as in deafness and in violence it protects the guilty often for generations and creates false innocence but may at times express the profoundest truth listening to trauma conversations with leader in oh that one's a good one Look at these amazing citations. All of these are really good citations. She cites herself a couple times, but that's okay. She does good work. Chapter 2, Violence, Disassociation, and Traumatizing Silence. Psychoanalysis, Werner Baldbur reminds us, began as a theory of trauma. How it emphasizes, how it emphasizes shifted, how its emphasis shifted, and to what extent has remained a matter of dispute. But most observers agree that since the Vietnam War, trauma has returned to the center of psychoanalytic concern. While analysts in many lands still remain focused on unconscious fantasy and innate aggression as the fundamental causes of human suffering, German analysts, like many of their colleagues in the U.S., have refocused on the effects of psychic reprocessing of psychological trauma. This is the importance of reading Karl Kraus and all those works are not translated into English. And even if they were translated, I have to do the extra work of pretending that to study German. The psychoanalysts of a country that created more traumatized people in more systematic way than any other in history has 
therefore also created generations of perpetuators, children and grandchildren. German psychoanalyst tells us must address trauma and its multi-generational effects on victims and perpetrators. Implicitly, he raises the question of how silence of all concern, including bystander participants, permitted, affirms, and refuses witness to the crimes proposed, also discussed at length at the contributors to the collective silence, German identity and the legacy of shame. The victim stands over more alone, Jill Stoffer, in speaking of ethical loneliness, the experience of being abandoned by humanity compounded by the experience of not being heard. Later, she notes, if any of us are lucky enough to have remained intact and unviolated, we don't want to hear that no matter what we do, we might end up destroyed, that the fabric holding together the world that we experience as relative safety is very fragile. We don't want to know that, and so we may find it difficult to hear a story where that is the message. That is one complication in how we hear. A great many of us probably inherit our own sense of our responsibilities from ideas about the autonomous self who is responsible only for actions freely undertaken. In other words, the idea that we bear responsibility only for those things that we done and intended. Ethical loneliness can only be understood intersubjectively, intrinsically involves others. The Viennese philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, I can't, I hate his name, wrote where, where we cannot speak thereof, we must be silent. Whereof we cannot speak thereof, we must be silent. That's one of the high mind idioms I live by. It's a Socratic idiom, I think. Thus he ended his early Tracticus Logico Philosophicus, Philosophicus, surely one of the most studied and probably the most least understood texts of the history of Western philosophy. When the science-minded Wiener Kreis wanted to discuss it with him, he reportedly sat in a corner reading Rabindra Tagore. But what did he mean by about silence? Most commentators think Wittgenstein Probably one of the most, oh, sorry, but Winston, trying to get his first book into print, wrote to a prospective publisher that it was really two works, one written and one unwritten. The unwritten was the more important. You will not be surprised to learn that the publisher rejected his work. <laughs> What's this guy talking about? <laughs> Fucking crazy philosopher. Beak. Silence does not make exciting writing and does not pay publishers well. It's anti-capitalist. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a problem with philosophy is just fighting sophistry. <laughs> everybody's a guru. Every everybody's a guru. Everybody's a sophist. But we clearly learn that Wittgenstein, though always seeking philosophical conversation, did not share Freud's preference for the talking cure. He seemed to believe that speaking of the unspeakable was irreverent, and he had no tolerance for idle chatter. And yet, his tortured philosopher who had lost three brothers to suicide and had seriously considered himself, was torn between a repeated need to make personal confessions and a claim that we must be silent. About what must we be silent? About what are we unable to speak? Like many of us who reach not only the limits of our capacity to speak of the good, of Ame, and of the holy, but also of suffering too, Terrible to name. He learned to be silent. His family, housed in a Viennese palace with almost a dozen grand pianos played by the greatest composers, resembled an emotional prison where the sons were expected to follow their demanding father into the steel industry, inclined towards the arts and other pursuits they could not oppose or satisfy. Carl, the father, and died one after the other. The family required the dead ones be no longer mentioned. Their spirits of those who departed had to be silenced. The process of Bernard Branchev called the pathological accommodation. Escape from the system of traumatizing, malignant narcissism was impossible. The philosopher fled to England, returning primarily to disinherit himself by giving away his vast fortune after his parents died. But he said little about his suffering, keeping silent. Similarly, Jacques Austerlitz, the long, mute, protagonist in Sebald's novel explains, I realized then how little practice I had in using my memory and conversely how hard I must have always been tried to recollect as little as possible, avoiding everything which related in any way 
to my unknown past. Inconceivable as it may seem to me today, I knew nothing about the conquest of Europe by the Germans and the slave state they set up, and nothing about the persecution I had escaped. I was always refining my defensive reactions, creating a kind of quarantine or immune system which, as I maintained my existence on a smaller and smaller space, protected me from anything that could be connected, however distant, with my own history. Only his extended conversation with the narrator, like a good psychoanalysis, begins to restore the links. That's the interesting thing about historical revisionism, eh? Silence and disassociation. We psychoanalysts are familiar with different, many different types of disassociation, from the mildest types of forgetting what we clearly once knew or intended, perhaps to schedule a dentist appointment to full amnesia after traumatic shocks like murder, rape, and torture. We know the kinds of phenomena formerly called multiple personalities. A patient horribly tortured in childhood sits down and in a voice we have never heard before, not clearly addressed it to the analyst, says, don't do that. You really shouldn't do that. You could get in trouble, and so on. The astonished analyst realizes only later that she or he has never met this part of the patient before. But the supervisor explains that this is really a great gift to the analyst and to the treatment. The analyst is hearing the seeing and seeing directly for the first time the internal conversation just now, enough relational safety has emerged between patient and analyst to make this moment possible and to make it usable. Another way, another one says something has been attending her university classes and taking notes in her handwriting, but that she had not been there. She wants help because she wants to be responsible for everything that is done in her name. I worked with her for many years. I heard her unrepentable stories. Such patients need the e kind ethical witness we will later discuss. Speaking with trauma theorist Kathy Carruth, who links trauma to silencing, extraordinary student and physician of disassociative conditions, Anno von der Hacht explains that the essence of trauma is the lack of support, of help, of comfort, being utterly left alone with the experience and having no one listening. He later continues, the therapist or other person bearing witness needs to be responsive, exhibiting emotional resonance. And that's why sometimes classical psychoanalysis is contra-indicted, because with the patient on the couch, he or she doesn't see the therapist and misses the resonance in his eyes. This may be very disruptive to many traumatized people because it reactivates their attachment trauma, the unavailability of their pa parents who might have responded with blank faces to them as children or turned away. Von der Hart makes it clear that listening need not be literal. It must be expressed. Resonance in the eyes as well as with the voice communicates ethical and therapeutic hearing. All this clinical psycho psychology stuff I take with a grain of salt. The therapy, he says, is about the patient's grief, coming to terms with the fact that what was will never be again. Continued silence abandons the patient, gives consent to horror, and abandons the transformative work of mourning. In the middle, we m meet many everyday clinical experiences harder to recognize, except by lurking sense that something is missing in the story or in the treatment. Freud taught us long ago to listen for the gaps in patients' conscious stories as evidence for the unconscious. In fact, he used such gaps as his most fundamental argument for the existence of unconscious mental life. Our right to assume the existence of something mental that is unconscious and to employ the assumption for the purpose of scientific work is disputed in many quarters. To this, we can reply that our assumption of the unconscious is necessary and legitimate and that we possess numerous proofs of its existence. It is necessary because the data of consciousness have a very large number of gaps in them, both in healthy and in, in people. Psychical acts often occur, which can be explained only by presupposing other acts, of which, nevertheless, consciousness efforts affords no evidence. It is necessary. So I want to read that in the original German. I have to. In the beginning, 
Freud believed, of course, in a mind topographically organized with a dynamic, unconscious, containing content censored from awareness because it was too painful or anxiety-producing to know. Oedipal desires or castration anxiety were prime examples, generating symptoms, dreams, and ship slips. Leader in the structural theory, conflict with the demands for the superego or the external world could produce unconsciousness. He could not, however, tolerate the idea that traumatic experience caused unconsciousness. So Ferenzi was banished and disassociation went unrecognized. Many of Freud's best ideas, like the complexity of temporality making sense backwards or the compulsion to repeat, had to wait for the wars of the mid-century to be worked through and for the founders to die. I believe we honor Freud, in whose Vienna house I am writing these words, by bringing back his central ideas, understanding better those who he introduced but did not develop, and reintegrating some of some that he exiled. In the past 40 years, for example, psychoanalysts was retrieved, has retrieved Freud's beloved travel companion and rejected rebel Sandor Forensi. It has learned to notice many kinds of disassociation. In one type, familiar in the U.S., patients enter therapy because of some problem at work or home, from just feeling terrible or because the medical doctor recommends therapy. The patient cannot explain the suffering and claims to have grown up in a perfectly normal family. I guess I'm just crazy. <laughs> Sometimes the disassociation yields easily to gentle and respectful questioning, and the patient comes to realize that what we call a backstory produced the difficulties, and the work can go forward. Often it turns out that siblings in the family are also struggling. Already, if there is a, any type of trauma, any history of violence or neglect, we are in the area of disassociation a kind of split mind like the like that described by Fairborn rather than that of classical repression where something once known has been censored due to conflict this common clinical experience as Winnicott might have said with some cultural differences psychotherapists readily recognize but often the trouble is less obvious and the disassociative process may be more complex let us think of the patient who feels unwanted and lost. As a child, he or she was required to be nearly invisible and never learned even to ask for needed things at school, like perhaps permission to go to the toilet or for the pencil when one was missing, never mind the affirmation, recognition, or, or support. There is a profound disconnection between what the patient believes is right and just for all human beings and what he is allowed to want for himself. This gap needs understanding, but perhaps neither patient nor analyst can see the link. Affirmation and support from the analyst helps nothing. The gap is too profound. Both people begin to feel hopeless. One day, however, the analyst wakes up in a state that Italians call Dormi Vigilia, between walking and sleeping. Dormi Vigilia, Dormi Veglia, Dormi Veglia realizing somehow that this patient reminds her of her younger self it's like sleep paralysis how had the analyst been deprived of something essential her father had come home from war and had never spoken about what he or she had seen or done there even as she grew older she was never permitted to ask even now as a teaching psychoanalyst she knew very little of her family's history or what why she has been required to be so unobtrusive as a child, or why she went into psychology or psychoanalysis in the first place. She had been too good. She had had to be good, not to earn praise, but to prevent something. She didn't know what. And the next session, remembering the work of Davoin and Godelaire, she asked her patient if he knew whether either of his parents or any of his grandparents had been in a war. Given the ages of those probably involved, there could have been fascists, war criminals, resistance fighters, exiled, children born in bomb shelters, or all of the above. I visited bomb sh bomb <laughs> bunkers in uh, Denmark, and I'm like, oh, there's definitely been some hanky-panky in those places. They were talking about these uh, intergenerational rape and, and stuff and on Twitter, and people come out and, and what what aboutisms? What about those authorities? What about those people? Somebody racist on the internet.
he began to find out how to have a personal history, gruesome as it was, that made sense to him. An Austrian psychotherapist recently told me that early in every treatment, she walks, she asks the parents and grandparents what were they doing during the war because every person living in her country still carries this history and lives it out every day, this day. Often, 75 years later, the patient does not consciously know the stories of atrocities, of resistance, of support, or bystanding for the criminal regime, or exactly how the family had been involved. But all this history lives in the house and in the family relationships, and no real therapy is possible without bringing out this history alive and into conversation. Rwanda, after Rwandan genocide, the people go back into the houses and you find out that the neighbor next door was the one that slaughtered the hands and feet of your challenging the silence taboo. Not in my family. Pre-2017 means bringing everything into question in a country and in families where everything seems so normal but so little can be spoken. All the idioms must be questioned. My point is that avoiding our own traumatic history can prevent working with patients' disassociation. Exactly. I mean, isn't that the basic for being a psychologist? I mean, that, that point is kind of scary that you have to even say that. Most of us patients and analysts both carry unconscious and disassociated scars that we bring into psychoanalytic process. Of course. This is, <laughs> this is why AI therapy is almost better. Only recently is the literature on the transgress transgenerational transmission of trauma, vicarious traumatization, teaching us how dangerous it is to work as analysts without knowing our own history. This is only recent? I thought that was an obvious. This is why philosophical education is important. It seems quite obvious to me that psychologists shouldn't be a psychologist if they haven't have a good relationship with their own families. <laughs> you have relationship counselors with 50 div 15 divorces. One need not to be theoretical relationship relationalists or intersubjectivists to get this point but it, but it helps the state of psychology is just in 2017 does something so obvious comes out knowing myself as the daughter of three generations of maternal suicides affects me and my patients and my supervisors not knowing this could create disaster or at least leave people terribly alone and misunderstood a word about self-disclosure in psychoanalysis a big topic in relational psychoanalysis for me what is called counter transference self-disclosure vicarious traumatization telling the patient how i feel about her or him is rarely necessary or to be recommended yeah sure you don't have to talk to the patient about it because the patients are usually crazy like out of out sorry i'm not a clinical psychologist they're usually out there you know so it's not really a good idea to talk to the patient unless the patient is, you know, self-reflective, advanced, helping you. Then who's the patient in that situation? The analysts, including personal history and counter-transference reactions, is involved at every moment in the patient's experience and in the psychoanalytic process and can never be neutral. Clinical wisdom, not neutrality, usually teaches us to say less rather than more. And yet, we cannot really hide from our patients when we try to, we often repeat the problematic situation that brought them to us anyway. Thus, a kind of open sincerity, authenticity is what's needed. Authenticity in makeup, prostitution, culture. Authenticity is almost not impos is impossible in neoliberal subjectivity culture. Yeah. Neoliberal subjectivity that is forwarded by the profession of psychology itself with their hive mind idioms. Authenticity is on, on the line here. It's more authentic to talk to the AI. If a patient asks me a direct question, I first try to, I first not to analyze the motives behind the question, as these will usually come out anyway, but rather to find out what the patient really wanted to know so that I do not say too much or answer the wrong question. But I make it clear that I will answer as much as I can out of respect for a fellow human being. Phenomenologist Bernard Waldenfels often quotes Paul Watzewick, one cannot answer. One cannot not answer. That's the opposite of Fuishima. One cannot not answer. This is the opposite of there is no why. To refuse to answer communicates something about our regard for the questioner's human dignity and worth. And we try to be sure our answer expresses this respect. 
and to refuse to answer or other ways. And there's plenty of other ways where the inauthenticity of the practice to come through as well. The procedural, the procedurality of the land acknowledgement, for example. The land acknowledgement is, she's calling, a reflection of our own trauma as well. Another kind of self-disclosure may be very subtle. Just saying we in some situations indicates to the other that we recognize the experience the patient is describing without going into any details. The therapist who asks about war history implies that she too comes from a family involved in Nazi times. I imagine that every therapist and patients alive in Japan today is in some way still related to the Great War. In Japan, this expression means World War II. Sometimes this simple expression reassures the other that we belong to the same human community. Not a small thing if the patient is consumed by shame. When someone humiliates us like that, we really want to disappear, a therapist or analyst might comment. Yet both of us, humans, have this experience and it no longer needs to be disassociated or denied. This linking between experience and between people has special importance when physical and mental violence have been involved. Violence, beating, torture, rape, mental brainwashing, and so on constitute an attack on the very humanness, on one's trust in others. Mental brainwashing, that's what I'm talking about. And one's trust in oneself and one's trust in the world. Shame, writes South African philosopher Bruce Jans, de-subjectifies. Like Agamben and Primo Levi, he recognizes that some human destruction is irreversible and that only others can speak for those destroyed. But still, like Jill Stoffer, who writes of ethical loneliness, he believes that witnessing, even silent witnessing, to injustice and horror is a moment on the way to a renewed ability to speak, a new renewed ability to listen. That is, a renewed subject status and a new subject experience. No, we're not talking about subject. We're talking about citizenship. Even more than a subject. Subject versus citizen. The subject is the very, subjectification is the very minimum to be a full subject. And after you're a full subject, that's when you are a quote, citizen of a republic a democracy. You awake. You participate. You aren't silenced. You don't silence others. The great idiom, I may disagree with what you, the other subject, you recognize the subject in other. I may disagree with what you say, but I will fight to the death to, dis to defend you, to say it. That's what anti-monarchy means. That's what anti-dictatorship is. The testimony that becomes possible, he writes, when true shame is felt, where bare life is experienced, is the testimony that both speaks to truth of what happened and bears witness to the length we and others would go to follow a prescribed view of the world. A prescribed view of the world. Again, we go back to the situation in China. It doesn't, it's not happening. And if it's happening, I don't believe it. I can't believe it. Meanwhile, the collective silence perpetuates shame and disassociation. Again, shame is an unfortunate word here. We need to disassociate or have a distinction between hearing and listening as well as Shame, kinds of shame, violence, some because she used other kinds of shame in the positive sense as well. Some kinds of violence can only go in the dark, go on in the dark, even in the twilight created by, and perpetuated by normative inequality. Silence protects the perpetuator and shames the victims. Already wounded in their basic humanity, sufferers and sometimes also criminals find no witness and no relief. Gradually, they disconnect from the memories, losing the capacity to tell their stories or make sense of their lives. This disconnection lives on into the next generation as parents and grandparents either fear or refuse to tell their children of their war experiences or of extreme humiliations. Even when there has been no guilt, only terror, silence may rule. A grandmother had hidden her husband escaped from a prison camp in Eastern Europe. She refused to speak about this many times, time after time after the end of the World War II, fearing that the Nazis would still come after her. As a result, the adult grandchildren's sense of this time resembles a dream or a blank, not the nightmare that the grandmother lived. I heard similar stories in Japan about grandfathers who had fought in China in the 30s 
their psychoanalyst grandchildren grew up feeling that something was wrong, but no one would ask them what, that they were not allowed to ask. In my own country, the unspeakable crimes of settler colonialism, eliminating indigenous peoples so that whites can possess, quote, possess, possess the land and chattel slavery in which human beings are bought and sold, inherited, kept illiterate, and beaten into submission and intergenerational rape in school. We are taught that these things have happened, but never who actually did them. Having visited the camps, we may know of the internment of our Japanese citizens during the war, but do not know the names of those who carried out this policy in our name. So violence haunts a land like crimes without perpetrators or victims, but only free-floating shame, nightmares, repetition, and confusion, a collective historical trauma, silencing women rarely regarded as crime or outrage continues to this day as a form of violence so common that it becomes imperceptible. And they silence one another, the feminists. And who's a woman? They silence each other. Even when one subject, someone objects, she may be called hysterical, shrill, or worse. She is picking a fight from the refusal to educate girls worldwide to the disappearing of women's voices in nearly every discipline or are, are talking about it too much as a form of violence as well. Our memory fails to explain how we came to this situation. We were born into a normative situation that took our silence for granted as something not needing any justification. Don't forget the brainwashing that the traumatized now the people in power, Israel and Palestine, feminists, controlling the carceral state today also imposes. Herman, 2009, asks what happened to the memory of a crime in the mind of the victim. The new victims become the perpetuators of the future. In the mind of the perpetuator and the mind of the bystander, she summarizes the answer of Daniel Barr, Baron, who had interviewed adult children of Nazi war crimes. The fathers did not know did the fathers did not want to tell the children did not want to know the truth became unspeakable so that all the left all were left in Stauffer's ethical loneliness unheard remembering and telling the truth about the terrible events are essential tasks Herman writes for both the healing of individual victims perpetuators and families for the restoration of the social order of course it is important to take care of speaking of violence, silence, and disassociation, victim and perpetuators. Best, perhaps, is to begin with the violence my country has done to others. In November 2018, after changing some yen dollars for me at the Hiroshima Bank, the teller asks, What brought me to her city? My people did a terrible thing to your people here, and I needed to see. Oh yes, she responded, my grandmother making a big gesture with both hands, a bomb. I could only speak, I could only make a deep bow in sorrow. We perpetuators need to speak so that those we have destroyed can and injured can speak. In other experiences, on the trip in Kobe, Japan, we had been talking about traumatic memory again in Europe and the need for the children of victims, perpetuators and bystanders to know so that we do not repeat terrible crimes. At lunch, over our beautiful bento boxes, our colleague after another, one colleague after another, spoke without any questions from me, saying that someone in the family had been fighting in China in the 30s, but that no one would ever speak about it. It continues only as a deep, dark cloud, present but disconnected from daily life. I love this focus on complicity here. We call this traumatic disassociation inflicted by silence. By this time, the grandchildren, perhaps psychoanalysts now, begin to ask the questions. The parents and grandparents have died. All the recent studies of transgenerational transmission of trauma, however, teach us that dreadful truths continue to haunt us like unconscious ghosts. Derrida, haunting. So what are we to do now if those who know what happened are dead? or unwilling to tell their children what they know. One possibility is to encourage ourselves and our children to read history in detail, possibly in groups, as an almost therapeutic project. Mm. 
we can no longer directly remember the history of the enslavement of African people in our country of 250 years, for example. Learning about it in detail and allowing the descendants of slaves to teach us about the history and its effects, however, may humble us. Learning about our own history of being slave owners. Angela Davis recently was connected to uh, slave owners. All of these... <laughs> These platform strawmanning people are like, ah, see, she's a slave owner. She's a slave owner too. But I mean, do, do you not, you know nothing about the history of intergenerational rape? The more we learn, the more questions we will ask and the less innocent we will feel. This seems to me a way of making the unconscious conscious and undoing this association. It's the uncovering silence and the fogging of memory. In the beginning, much is clear. Torturers, murderers, totalitarian dictators, parents who employ unspeakable violence of uncountable kinds to control their children. These are the victimizers, the perpetuators, the criminals, the tortured, the murdered, the brutalized, incested, and the humiliated. These are often victims, often complete, completely innocent. But let's take a few steps back, not to mention generations, and we enter Primo Levi's gray zone in his last years, decades after Return, he described the moral world of Auschwitz, where many prisoners, clearly victims of Nazi regime, became victimizers to greater and lesser degrees, from assisting in the gas changers to stealing food. This is what Arendt was talking about, the camp mentality. Giddens talks about, we found understanding in varying degrees for the, these victims, victimizers, cruel as many of them were, far more than the well-fed Germans and Austrians who pretended to not know of the camps, often located in their own neighborhoods. These people pretended to be victims too, victims of a terrible government, which they had enthusiastically supported, by the way, who committed crimes in their names. They claimed innocence, the rabbis that would name and count for the Germans. But we are not directly concerned with moral equivocation, no, we don't want to play oppression Olympics here and semi-conscious evasion of responsibility. So this question will return through the back door. Rather, as psychoanalysts, we must ask what unconscious processes lead to the fogging of the memory and the confusion of victimhood and perpetuation of and perpetuation or as relationist relationalist Jessica Benjamin 2004 would say doer and done too. Psychoanalysts, as, as a war in Poland teaches us, defines itself by just such questions. Interesting. What makes an attitude uniquely psychoanalytic is concern for the power of unconscious forces. The analysts working in the service of helping the patient come to know his or her own mind with ruthless candor and unfettered by shame or guilt. Assuming then the psychoanalyst struggled to assuming we agree then that the psychoanalyst struggled to help ourselves and our patients to know what unconsciously prevents our own candor about history victim or victimizer standard status, what have we learned so far? Why, in short, might we not want to know? What maintains the fog, carefully protected by generational clouds of silence? Why does the patriarchy persist? In some cultures, of course, we have the honor of the family, never to my knowledge listed as among the properly psychoanalytic defenses. But now we have the work of the Canadian-German psychoanalyst and his historian Roger Free, author of Not in My Family, German Memory and the Holocaust. With extraordinary courage, Free recounts his own journey towards seeing what had always been right there in his life. His beloved grandfather's Nazi status and active participation. His book includes the photograph of his grandfather in the uniform of a Nazi motorcycle club, the image that shocked his grandson into realization. It further describes Free's later discoveries about the exact... And that's why you need the grandson's shocked face for Free to wake up as well about the exact work of his grandfather did during the war on the terrifying Wurgeslandwaffen rockets aimed mostly at London only ended up ended because 
the Allies bomb their launching sites. Not only has Free needed to protect his own attachment to his grandfather, a powerful unconscious motivator against the candor of which Poland writes, but then he must struggle, as do all the thoughtful later Germans and Austrians with their difficult questions that blur the lines between guilt and innocence. And this isn't to say the Allies were on the right foot either. The Allies, what they did to the throwing the blacks and the Quebecois in the first lines. The Allies, what they did with their own camps, the English camps in South Africa, and so on. This is what my Ritual Traces series talks about. Victimizers and victims. But I am getting ahead of my story. First, let's propose some informal working definitions. Imperfect but also help clarify. Let us agree to call a victim someone who suffers injustice that is n not only suffers as one might from an accidental injury, but one who suffers from an unjust discrimination or violence. In this sense, one is not a flood victim, even though it is easy to feel victimized by impersonal forces, but one m may actually be a victim of an unjust racial or economic system. Clearly, the term may be used in various ways, but for our purposes, the reality and sense of injustice seems indispensable. Second, a perpetrator creates or inflicts injustice on other human beings. Whatever form this injustice may take, the perpetrator never intends to be on the receiving end of the treatment being inflicted on the victim or victims. The French Revolution. You are putting other people in the guillotine until you realize you're the next in line for the guillotine. If the doer is willing to be done to, in the exact same way, we are speaking of a game played with rules. Refusal or refusal of reciprocity is indispensable to injustice and to being a perpetrator. An enormous philosophical literature exists around this question. But for now, we seek only working definitions so that we can go on to find a phenomenology of memory of fog for psychoanalysis. How can we define historical trauma, historical collective trauma? Let us say that collectively we are speaking of wars, won or lost, genocides, of all the violent association with wars and genocide and totalitarianism. But the collective historical traumas do not seek psychoanalysis, nor for the most part do not imme immediate perpetrators the dictators, torturers, and murderers. So the historical trauma concerning us here, silenced by the unconscious processes to which we have already referred in passing, mostly hides under a mask of normalization until it can no longer. The grandson of the Nazi, the granddaughter of the Hiroshima victim, or the death camp survivor from Europe speak through their symptoms and dreams to a psychoanalyst who is ready to hear more than today's report. These children and grandchildren grew up with the anxieties and hints they could not interpret. Parents who will never buy property in the US because they might suddenly need to move again. Grandparents who teach their children and grandchildren to trust no one without saying why. Parents who suddenly stop talking when children come into the room or fight to mask their sorrow. There are stoical, hard-working parents who simply seem to have some years missing from their lives, or some people unaccountably missing, leaving their children to wonder why. Often, the child begins to wonder why he or she cannot make any impact on such a parent, where the sudden silences or rages come from, whether the child is doing something wrong. The psychic holes transmit themselves almost automatically across generations, until an analyst attuned to unconscious forces of history asks why. Perhaps it's not just through psychoanalysts that we can come to that sublime imminence. Thus, we can say that historical trauma through it belongs originally to those tortured, murdered, and dispossessed or driven away, comes to us more often in the next generations, and needs us to be on alert for it in whatever forms it may take, in our own cultures. In North America, we may see possible traumatic stress, substance abuse, depression in familiar and unfamiliar home forms, and return to the political forms that created the historical trauma and the slavery and colonialism in the first place. In France, 
we have learned from Francois Davoine to listen for, for historical trauma in many forms of madness. In each geographical and cultural location, other manifestations appear. But every clinician, as long as we live in a world of war and violence, must learn to pick up and hear these indicators, first in ourselves and then in our patients. More than once in my many years of practice in New York, searching with a patient for liberation from a life incarcerated in parental violence or depression, I dreamed of European concentration camps only to discover that the patient was having similar dreams. In both instances, the patient later found Holocaust history in the family. Yes, we work in the service of the other, even at night. Now, this is a very important form of complicity that the psychoanalyst has to examine. That the patient, that they became a psychologist to heal themselves. That the patients, <laughs> you know, the patients are there to heal them, almost. Clearly, attention to language claims a high priority, but now we have come to the least definable, but perhaps most important word. Visually, fog creates a blur that keeps us from seeing what may be so close as to endanger us. The fog of war. Auditorily, fog resembles static or noise that covers. I like how she goes back to the auditory, because that's her issue with deafness ruthless candor or a voice that could provide the ruthless candor protecting us from knowing what is too painful or guilt inducing to know in the context of historical trauma this fog or static may be the historical crimes as in the case of roger free's family and with so many others an austrian colleague mentioned earlier tells me that sooner or later in every treatment she asks where family members were during world war ii possibilities include the Wehrmacht, the man armed forces, that means that they were probably fighting and dying in Russia. The SS, the elite group of very high numbers of Austrians and man aged all the concentration camps under Heinrich Himmler. Resistance, very small numbers living in hiding and very few others. No one was uninvolved, though approximately 90 Austrians are known to have hidden Jews or help them escape. The fog of memory in Austria has taken the form of a quick conversion of Austrians into Hitler's first victims, showing how malleable the victim-victimizer discourse can be. This they conveniently forgot. The Allies supported this forgetting after the war and to keep Austria in the Western Bloc in the Cold War, how enthusiastically they had welcomed the Nazis and persecuted the Jews to extermination. In this fog, my questions in the birthplace of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, where are the Jewish psychoanalysis? Meet puzzled faces. I guess there are two or three here now, they say. Then a visit to the central cemetery shows elaborate, well-tended monuments to Beethoven, Schubert, and Mozart. Not far from the Jewish section, unintended, untended with gravestones, knocked down and in ruins. Similarly, in the U.S., our political discourse about racial problems often seems to per forget that we whites enslaved fellow human beings here for hundreds of years and cruelly punished the, any who tried to escape for their own human dignity and who tried to learn to read or who tried to learn to read. Fog, of course can arise in less wretched ways to protect natural and needed bonds. We needed this most commonly when a small child arrives in school with an unusual set of bumps and bruises sent to the school psychologist who asks what happened. We hear that he fell off his bicycle. The pattern of injuries does not support the story, so we understand that the child is afraid of speaking the truth. The truth might well mean he will be beaten again, that the child care workers will come and take him away from the family, or some evil we adults cannot Im imagine. So he fell off his bike. Or yes, they hit me because I was bad. I won't do it anymore. The victim has transformed himself into the one who makes the problem. A very simple example. This very simple example is like everything, of what becomes an automatic form of what Fairbond would call the moral defense. We are not allowed to ask questions of the parents. What were you doing in the war? Because we need their protection. 
in order, in turn, to protect the perpetuators from having to speak of their own crimes. And in light of our love and admiration for them, they may come to feel more and more like the innocent victims. After all, we did it for our children. It becomes more and more difficult for, their, for either generation or for the grandchildren to emerge from this foggy unconscious into ruthless candor, unfettered by shame and guilt. The parents are in their own fog that was given by the grandparent. The fog exacts a high price in personal symptoms, in familial and societal confusion, and as we see in both Europe and the US, such fog also leaves us vulnerable to dictators and demagogues similar to those who wreaked havoc in the past. We have no way to say, look what happens when you listen to the discourse of hatred. In other versions, family violence may be fogged out, hiding its reality from the children, creating mere visions, more visions of what Bernetzi named confusion of the tongues by blaming the child for incest, for beatings, or for all of forms of humiliation, exploitation, and neglect, not until the children have children of their own and find themselves confused by the way they treat their own children may they ask for help from an analyst or from their adult siblings. Unable ourselves even to recall much of the worst abuse, our anal analysis finds us even deeper in self-blame. If we are lucky, we have siblings also trying to find their way who begin to question us and tell us what they remember. Eyewitnesses can help with revisioning the meanings we had always accepted. Maybe I am not good for nothing. Maybe I was being exploited ruthlessly, denigrated with verbal and nonverbal attacks, even to the, the throwing of knives when I did not meet expectations. Maybe my brother, maybe you, my brother, were constantly terrified for the next beating. And remember, I do not, that sometimes I tried to protect you. All of us have been, all of us may have needed the fog of memory just to survive. We could not allow ourselves to believe how dangerous our life actually was. As adults, we, es we helped each other with the fog. Now, let's be clear here. We've never escaped the fog. <laughs> That's the, the moment you think you've escaped the fog, right? In your personal mind, you might feel everything, but there's still a fog. There's always a fog. There's always a haunting. Another source of unconscious fogging can be, now it's fogging can be what psychoanalysts call the intergenerational transmission of trauma when the parents come from families where the parents are missing and no one asks for the historical circumstance behind this absence. You know, everybody has to go do a family tree and those with whom they reside are violent or otherwise hateful. The same parents may have no sense of good enough parenting. They may have no sense of good enough parenting. Their adult, their now adult children may be more or less grateful to be living, realize that these parents should never have had children, but knew no better. It is hard even for those beaten down to know whether one's own parents were more victims or more perpetrators, though we can easily provide clear instances that belong to each category. We are left with many in question. This is why the whole victim perpetrator thing sometimes, yeah, it's important to take responsibility, but at the same time, it's all fog. Just as Primo Levi wrote, and Primo Levi, all these anthropology is the most is the is a very good place to study complicity because they are the ones who, you know, were at the forefront of psychologizing, moralizing, normalizing colonialism. That we've been, that psychology inherited. So this is more defensive fogging, or is this something wrong with our categories? Is this more defensive fogging, or is this something wrong with our categories? Let me say here clearly that I am not a radical postmodernist. Let me also say that there are no such thing as radical postmodernists. We have postmodern situation, okay, and many different types of ways of dealing with it. While there is often more than one perspective on the truth, more than one true story to be told at a given event, Rashomon effect, there is truth. Rashomon is a great movie. There is truth and there is falsehood. There is justice and there is injustice, even if we do not always know exactly what it is. So how do we emerge from the real or neurotic guilt, from useful and destructive shame into ruthless candor, at least within ourselves? That's important, at least within ourselves. We can't 
it's like almost imp the postmodernism is in the situation. So that's the difference. Like this is why we have to look at. I did a video on the creation of the neoliberal subject, psychoanalysts, psychoanalysis, that invention of the so-called talking cure takes the attitude that careful, attentive listening that stays close to the other suffering, but ready to engage the unconscious demons often of historical trauma and our own complicity in it or knowledge that those we love have done terrible things to us and to others can be liberating. Psychoanalysis expects that we need each other, turn toward the other, we may sing sorrowfully. I can see clearly now, the fog is gone. I can see clearly now, the fog is gone. Uh, so, great, great writing, great thinking. Chapter 3. This is not psychoanalysis. Perhaps the most famous, by no means the last silencing in the history of psychoanalysis, occurred in the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society on February 1st, 1911. Alfred Adler had in the previous delivered a paper on the masculine protest at the central problem of neurosis. The masculine protest as the central problem of neurosis. Now Freud responses, according to meticulous note-taker Otto Rank, saying that this is not psychoanalysis, explaining at length why his views and Adler were incompatible. Actually, it's very compatible. This is, uh, is why we have to read Karl Krauss. Okay. His own understanding, of course, defines psychoanalysis as he was to repeat later in various contexts. Adler left the society as soon as after the meeting. According to Nunberg and Feder, as reported by Martin Bergman, Adler presented to the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society his view that the masculine protest was present in all women. Freud responded by saying, Adler's writings are not a continuation upward, nor are they a foundation underneath. They are something else entirely. Okay, so it's not psychoanalysis, it's not science. That's what he, I think he more means. According to Bergman, the assembled disciples in their comments show that they did not understand that at this moment, the boundaries of psychoanalysis were being defined. For the first time, Bergman. Oh, everybody read Bergman. These disciples increasingly did understand that discussion within the Wednesday group, which became the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, could occur only within these boundaries. As Adler, Jung, Tausk, and Steckel departed, each taking others along, the minutes written by Otto Rank proceeded as if nothing had happened but their voices had gone silent in the service of orthodoxy. This is not the first time that's happened to psychology, psychoanalysis. This happens all the time. By 1914, and we can see this with every APA guideline. By 1914, Freud saw that the only official authority that only official authority could protect from the pitfalls inherent in the practice of psychoanalysis. The person who has to distinguish between madness and sanity. I considered and it becomes a legal thing. That's the problem within the essence of psychoanalysis. I considered it necessary to form an official association because I feared the abuses to which psychoanalysis would be subjected as soon as it became popular. There should be some headquarters whose business it would be to declare all this nonsense has nothing to do with analysis. This is not psychoanalysis. For many years, Freud himself remained the headquarters, that headquarters, so that the requirements of orthodoxy shifted as his worldviews developed. In his last years, he himself commented, when a man is endowed with the power, it is hard for him not to misuse it. Hmm, wonderful. Another institutional control emerged early in the forms of journals, all under the strict control of the Wednesday group members. See, this is why it was always so subject to CIA control. When Steckel, editor of Zanderblatt, departed from the Wednesday group, Freud directed all the others to leave the journal, thus removing the possibility of independent conversation. Boss 1996 notes that even today, psychoanalytic journals effectively control access to conversation, deciding what is and not within the bounds of psychoanalysis, and the journal editors 
understand it. Over time, all members come to understand that they could not question Freud, even when he changed his own views. Bergman, 2011, replacing the early topographical theory with the structural theory, including the dual instinct claim. After the initial whiplash, non-Kleinian analysis simply have left the death instinct out of the discussion. <laughs> Americans opted for a more opportunistic, optimistic, though unembodied ego psychology. Loyalty kept most analysts silent. Isn't this reminiscent of what's happening today? I think that's what she's doing. In a compliance and conformity that reminded Eric Fromm of attitudes and practices within dictatorships. When Fromm criticized Ernest Jones' orthodoxy supporting attack on Ferenzi's sanity in the Freud biography. Oh, and then they all, <laughs> they all point each other at, they're all insane. It's a fog of war. <laughs> We're all coming out of war, and then they point each other and call each other insane. Jacob Arlo responded that in psychoanalysis, there is no monolithic structure with a party line. Fromm, as we shall see, had already learned otherwise. Silencing in psychoanalysis, as well as among those included, excluded, who form other psychotherapeutic groups, had been and continues to be far more complicated than mere gagging, or even thought controlled by authoritarian. Remember, we're talking about platforming of straw men. We don't completely erase the crazy ones. We just platform people. It's all about platforming. At least three historical relational phenomenon have been inter interlocked. And all of this stuff is used by systems of control today. The institutional structure of psychoanalysis, including the training analysis, and a tendency to protect the leaders from criticism. The historical trauma of persecution, migration, and extermination generating the silences of the shame, self-silencing, protecting individual psychoanalysis from exclusion, and psychoanalysis from the creative contributions. Self-silencing. Uh, psychopolitics. On the, on the politics of psychopolitics. Psychopolitics is everything today. Twitter. We go on Twitter. We don't need the CIA anymore. I go there and just say, wah, blah, blah. Everything you do is part of the panop the neoliberal panopticon, much more advanced than the panopticon than the that Bentham and Foucault talk about. The neoliberal panop the neoliberal panopticon. You don't even need the I, right? Everybody does a self silencing, self policing. Let's consider each in turn, understanding that they refuse to stay separated. Institutional structures. Soon after the incident previously provided. Freud invited the six most trusted followers and disciples, Otto Rank, Hans Sykes, Max Ettingsen, Ernest Jones, Sandor Ferenzi, and Carl Abraham to form a secret committee, the Signet Ring Group. Jung seems to have known he was excluded. This group served, I mean, yeah, Jung is just a crazy, <laughs> and you should see Jung's um, racist rants too. This group served as both kitchen cabinet and intentional defense team until 1924 when Runk left over the birth trauma and Abraham died in 1925. Even later, Ettington and Jones remained close, supporting Freud in interpreting Ferenzi's innovations as reflecting pathology. At any cost, even in the face of the Nazi takeover in Berlin, they felt they had to protect psychoanalysis. Psychoanalytic institutions may have inherited a tendency towards secrecy and ambiguity from this period. The historian of psychoanalysis Ricardo Steiner seems to attribute this style of non-communication especially to Ernest Jones, who early, early on suggested that the secret ring group to Freud and served as a president of International Psychoanalytical Association, IPA, during the dangerous years of the 1930s. But more careful research into the Freud Jones correspondent would clarify much. Did Freud know that Jones did not really want the Jewish analysts in Britain? Though we now have the Freud Jones correspondence, much is still hidden, and we do not know whom or what this silence intends to protect. The training analyst system developed in Berlin and reluctantly accepted by Freud after his cancer convinced him that he would not forever be able to control the future of his movement and became and remains to this day another important source of silencing 
psychoanalysis. Not only does it include requirements that candidates be analyzed by already anointed training analysts who report to training progression committees and hold complete control over the fate of these candidates, the training analysts themselves have survived rigorous tests of orthodoxy and compliance over many years. Many, though not all, institutes outside the IPA have rejected the training analyst system. No, they still use it. It's still part of a lot of things. Unfortunately, many, of, many have developed informal, even cultish means of enforcing compliance and accommodation. Independent thinkers either go silent or become courageous outsiders. Freud himself believed that the analysis was learned one-to-one, -one, surely an unsystematic but often deeply effective and convincing approach rather like apprenticeship. Freud himself was the ultimate Meister Singer, who seekers from everywhere traveled. Like Wagner's hero, he knew his Wissenschaft and was even more an art. But art, including literature and music, under authoritarians, as artists were soon to learn under the National Socialists, became either perverted into propaganda, stolen or destroyed, notwithstanding Dali. It had also it had also, as Freud himself expected, been difficult to maintain a sense of creativity in psychoanalysis once it became subservient in the medical profession. Not surprisingly, relational, intersubjective innovations came to prominence in psychoanalysis in the U.S. only in the years after psychologists lodged a legal challenge to the hegemony of medical psychoanalysis. Some psychiatrists participated in the newer thinking, of course, but I think of names like Stephen Mitchell, Robert Stolkro, Jessica Benjamin, George Atwood, Lewis Aaron, Adrian Harris, and many more, all psychologists excluded from the Institutes of the American Psychoanalytic Association until the 80s, and thus also from the IPA. And this, is, this, this is all, so again, we have psychoanalysis, which is probably the best, then we have psychology, and then we have psychiatry. Okay, at least you see in psychoanalysis something is happening, some sort of reflection is happening. Not, not so in psychology. I think it's safe to say that Freud would have, not so as much, would have firmly disapproved of the rigid rules of the admission to the IPA that he and the early analysts founded to protect psychoanalysis. Maybe, perhaps, none of, so you, see, you can see that Freud disagrees with himself too and nobody could say anything. None of these psychoanal psychologists psychoanalysis, not to mention the brilliant clinical social workers, could be members today. And yet, training analysis systems itself, gradually generating the elaborate and closed hierarchy of training analysis, became a requirement only when the founders saw that they were truly mortal. Freud in the mid-1920s with his cancer, Jung later with his cardiac problems, both had recommended training analysis earlier but both had warned for as long as possible to keep real control over who became an analyst. The training analysis inherited this control from the founders and long maintained it to this day. The cost of this system increased over the years and the stifling of creativity when saying something unorthodox could result in never becoming a training analysis, never being truly included locally or internationally. Psychoanalysis became risk averse, and the cost, largely invisible and silent, lay on the young and idealistic analysts as well as on patients who had to be analyzable. Because historian of psychoanalysis Paul Rosanne's voice had now gone mute, let me know, let me quote his concluding words on silences around the training analysis system and elsewhere. The issue of training analysis seems to me the tip of a large overall historical subject, which, as I say, had kept me fascinated as a member or matter of scholarship for four decades now. Once it was a question of keeping quiet the fact that Freud had analyzed his own daughter, Anna. In the future, I hope that Freud's neglected interests in phylogenetics as well as telepathy will receive the full attention that they deserve. It is no tribute his memory narrow him down to what may be plausibly accepted today.
the whole question of money in the history of psychoanalysis also needs to be adequately explored. I anticipate that the uncensored publication of Freud's various correspondences, which will go on after anyone alive today still is around, will continue to be challenging and instructive. The field is, I think, inherently strong enough to withstand the examination which all important subjects deserve. Probably not. Silence itself belongs at the graveyard, not to the life of the mind. But the organized psychoanalysis found other ways of silencing people. We have no doubt intergenerationally inherited the effects, tendencies to con consider people's heretics or at heretics or at least untrustworthy as keepers of the orthodoxy of the time. Heretics are important. We must listen to the heretics. One, the habit of describing one's opponent as insufficiently analyzed, oh my god, becomes a particularly pernicious form of dismissiveness and humiliation, oh my god. So all this talk about hysteria goes down the toilet when you see that psychoanalysts are always calling each other hysterical too, against which those so silenced or excluded could rarely find any defense. Hysterical needs to be a co collective thing. This whole thing is hysterical. This is, hyster this is the hysteria of psychoanalysis itself, the hysteria of psychology itself. Another particularly malignant and more than a tendency excluded gay and lesbian people from pathology. Today it's masculinity. Although Freud himself did not share his view, psychoanalysis in the U.S. silenced shame and attempted conversion of gay analysts and patients. Now it's going to the other way. Believable stories circulate of senior American psychoanalysts who threatened gay colleagues if they came out or tried to practice psychoanalysis openly. And today, intersectionality is at war with itself. We're not allowed to talk about it. Protecting orthodoxy and orthodoxy as protection. From the beginning, the circle around Freud took on a religious tone, even while it continued to examine from various angles the psychological motivation for religious belief. Interesting. Culminating in the future of an illusion. Max Graff, father of little Hans and member of early Wednesday group, describes the atmosphere. I have compared the gathering in Freud's home with the founding of a religion. However, after the first dreamy period and the unquestioning faith of the first group of apostles, the time came when the church was founded. Freud began to organize his church with great energy. He was serious and strict in the demands he made of his pupils. He permitted no deviations from his orthodox teaching. Subjectively, Freud was of course right, for that which he worked out with so much energy and sequence, and which was yet to be defended against the opposition of the world, could not be rendered inept by hesitations, weakening, and tasteless ornamentation. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem with it. I mean, it's, it's not like Freud was doing something wrong or anything. He, he was trying to, it just makes sense to do that. But the road to, what is it? The road to hell is paved with good intentions and the, and the, the gates of heaven are opened by the edge lord, the devil's advocate, by the advocatus de diobalus or whatever. Good hearted and considerate though he was in private life, Freud was hard and relentless in the presentation of his ideas. When the question of his science came up, he would break with his most intimate and reliable friends. If we do consider him as a founder of a religion, we may think of him as a Moses, full of wrath and unmoved by prayers. A Moses like the one Michelangelo brought to life out of stone to be seen in the church of San Pietro in Vincelini in Rome. After a trip to Italy, Freud never tired of talking to us about this statue. The memory of it he kept for his late last book. In the meantime, Freud's theories spread over ever further all over the world. Inspired adherents appeared everywhere. New pupils, new apostles. One day, Freud brought into circle a tall, good-looking physician from Switzerland. Freud spoke of him with great warmth. It was Professor Jung from Zurich. Another time, he introduced a gentleman from Budapest, Dr. Ferenzi, 
branches of the Freudian church were founded in all parts of the world. Even Freud's family knew that he was a dominant personality. His grandson, Anton Freud, wrote, Ordinary emperors and kings have only one court. Grandfather had two. The first court was psychoanalytic one. The second court belonged to grandfather's private life. You do not have to be Galileo to notice that this one revolved around grandfather too. My earlier and surely incomplete reading of Freud's authoritarian style attributed his tendency to exclude, shun, silence dissenters to his intense desire to be regarded among the greatest of Western ground takers with Copernicus and Darwin, complexifying the clear theories of infantile sexuality, the Oedipus, and the drives, not to mention diluting the pure gold of analytic practice with the copper of suggestion, could not be tolerated. The great Mo Moses might have become forgotten nobody. But living and working in Freud's Vienna, including several months in which unrenovated veranda of his house from which he watched his children play in the garden has taught me something else. We later born psychoanalysts know we do not know that more or less 200,000 Jews lived within walking distance of Freud's house. I do not exaggerate much in 1900 and we do not know that all of them were gone by the end of 1938. Freud and his immediate family escaped to London, but despite his efforts to get visas for them, his four sisters met a fate described in detail by Cooper White. She quotes a Treblinica survivor who testified that one approached the commander, showing him an identifying document saying that she was the sister of Sigmund Freud and asking to be given light office work. The commander said there must have been a mistake and told her that in two hours, there should be a train to Vienna. She could have left all her valuables and documents here, have a bath, and after the bath, she would receive her documents and travel permits to Vienna. She went to the bathhouse from which she never returned. Cooper White also lists the names and fates of the 11 Jewish members of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society who were unable to emigrate after the Unschlung, Germany's 1938 annexation of Austria. And the end came swiftly in Vienna. The streets near Freud's house are lined with Stropenstlein, remembering the names and death camps of whose used to live there in what houses, often with a note that there were 57 others, or in this house there was 110 who were gathered to wait for transport. One lives in a spectacularly beautiful crime scene with a determined veneer of normality. I am informed by local psychoanalysis that only two or possibly three Jewish psychoanalysis live in practice in Vienna today. When I told them that my own experience of psychoanalysis had been primarily and extensively among Jewish colleagues and patients, they seemed mildly surprised. Where did these people come from? They wondered. But the clouds had long been there threatening. Not only did Vienna, the fog I guess, not only did Vienna long have a haven for Eastern European Jews, including Freud's parents, elected a rapidly anti-Semitic mayor in 1997 from whom the Emperor Franz Joseph could no longer protect his city. The very success of Jewish leaders in business, in the arts, in the intellectual life of the Wiener, Modern, or Jung Wein encountered a deadly envy, hearkening back to the worst medieval stereotypes. And this was only the secular form of hatred. The Catholic Church deeply ingrained in Austrian life, even to this day, no shopping on Sunday, even now, also nurtured the deep roots of anti-Jewish hatred dating before anyone's memory. Here is an example probably known to both Freud and Hitler. Years ago, when I was studying Heidegger in order to teach his early work, I learned of his Catholic background and influence by the popular Austrian preacher Abraham Asanka Clara, who, like Heidegger, was born near Meskirchlich, but died in Vienna. He was a rabid anti-Semite, proclaiming, After Satan, Christians have no greater enemies than Jews. They pray many times each day that God may destroy those pestilence, famine, and war. Aye, that all beings and creatures may rise up with them against the the Christians.
According to the biographer Safrensky, Heidegger's earliest writings celebrated the setting of a monument to Santa Clara. Robert Michel, authority of history of Catholic anti-Semitism, the dark side of the church, believed that Mayor Karl Luger found in Santa Clara the most important impetus for his anti-Semitism. So it was shocking walking around the first district to find a street named after Santa, Santa Clara than a statue of him in Volkinson Park near the Albertina Museum and Stopper Opera House and later a plague on a plaque honoring him in a church whose name I cannot remember. So when we read in Cooper White that anti-Semitism shaped the early history of psychoanalysis, we recognize something. It is still in the air, there, unheimlich, as Freud would have said, and unconsciously, like the air we breathe, not knowing it is poisonous. It's a remnant of the fog. If we do not seem Jewish, it comes out. On a warm spring evening, my husband and I visited one of the charming Hüge, new wine gardens, not far from the Strapenbahn. When we paid our bill, the friendly waiter, eager to show off his English, told us that he had learned it working in the U.S., but returned to Austria because he couldn't bear working for poor wages for a Jew. He expected us to understand and agree. It all happened so fast that we scarcely believed we had heard him, and he was gone. So Freud's authoritarian style now takes on an additional meaning for me, that of the pater familias, absolutely determined to protect his own and never to give in to those who would dilute his discoveries or leave us weak and vulnerable, whether to the anti-Semites. Hmm. So this is the, you know, the both the victim and the perpetrator kind of thing that she's doing with Freud himself. The medical profession wanting to exclude lay analysts. So she's analyzing Freud here, or to other thinkers with other alternative theories, like Adler. We may regret the losses of Freud's doctrinaire style produced, but the context perhaps makes his style more forgivable. Amazing. We, however, are left with this legacy of silencing. This is the best work on complicity so far. Douglas Kirstner has described this remainder. See, she does, she's doing a basically a familial history within the field of psychoanalysis. Has described this remainder in four large U.S. classical institutes in horrifying detail. The powerful have been able to protect their own crimes and manipulation while excluding those who would speak out or think otherwise in the name of psychoanalysis. This is all, this is it. That's what the whole legal system, that's the whole legal system works. You can afford a lawyer, you can pay yourself out. Though this is harder to document, and if you're a truthful person, if you're an idiot, you're going to get <laughs> the law is going to come down on you. Though this is harder to document, rumor has it that the dissidents' institutions, non-IPA, have not been immune to such problems. This is the idea of, of having to use your amendment rights, be silent. In Kirstner's view, those are all connected. In Kirstner's view, they exist in a medical and non-medical institutes worldwide. He writes, institutional structures and problems surrounding training are not fundamentally different around the world. Primarius has argued plausibly that historically training, especially training analysis, became transformed into an instrument of power that promoted conformity, isolation, and stagnation in psychoanalytic institutes. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Psychoanalytic ice, ice roof, legal system, police, all of this. Psychoanalytic institutions are normally organized as guilds, which in my view are really internally focused cliques. They aim at the perpetuation of their own ways of thinking, social reproduction, what they assume to be their own body of knowledge, I'm adding, that they pass on to their students and tend to foreclose approaches that challenge their assumptions. They are not part of a wider university culture, even the university now, right? Despite its many, I mean, if it was the case that they were a part of a wider university culture, then perhaps the discipline, the only ivory tower that could fight this, which was philosophy, wouldn't be psychologized today with panpsychism and psychologism invading and the hive mind idioms invading the psychology institutions itself. 
we can see that the modern conflict of the faculties, check out my video, modern conflict of the faculties, and the other video, from the APA to the CIA, intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism, or my other video, talking about neoliberal subjectivity, my ver my, all my videos in my playlist called Unwitting Colonizers, they are not part of a wider university culture, despite its many faults, at, last, at least rest on some wider protocols and accountability structures. They don't have to. They don't have any accountability. Kirstner primarily, and they expect primarily, they expect accountability from the other faculties. Accountability to them. Kirstner primarily, and we can see that neoliberalism has taken up that structure, the neoliberal carceral conflict, conflicting state that Agamben talks about the old systems of the prison and the new systems of neoliberal subjectivity working together, totalitarianism of the mind, policing. This is why the global theory industry, where we talk about how the policing of the left is done by the left itself. Kirstner primarily attributes the problems in institutional psychoanalysis to its power structures unchallenged by university checks and balances, academic freedom, and the evidence checking available in most academic fields. Academic fields that are not related to law, Secretive progression committees, lengthy training analysis, the training analysis system, and so on, have closed down the open inquiry he found in studying the first decades of psychoanalysis. Same thing is happening with law. Same kind of secretiveness goes with who becomes judges, at least in Canada. Again, all my views are from the Canadian perspective. When, one, when none of these structures existed, though Kirstner does not make the comparison, Daniel Shaw's study of the operation of cults and their malignantly narcissistic leaders come to mind. <laughs> Given the economic system in which an analyst depends on referrals from others within the institutional structure, neoliberalism, neoliberal scientism, leaving the cult may seem foolhardy or impossible, even though it seems to me that the traumatic history of emigration also played a role in the authoritarian attitudes of the psychoanalysts in the U.S. and elsewhere. Hmm. The old victims become, not even the victims, perpetrators become <laughs> new perpetrators. I find Kirstner's studies and analysis indispensable. Even after Freud, we have the stories of excommunication and shunning. One method shame shamelessly practiced by Ernest Jones, and this excommunication is going too far today. Half of the feminists are fighting the other half of the feminists now. Exercise against forensi and other was refusal to publish and condemnation to the ranks of insanity. Freud himself discovered forensi to Max Eddington as a neurotic, but no psychoanalyst thought oneself exempt from neurosis. No psychoanalyst thought oneself exempt from neurosis. Jones placed forensi, arguably Freud's most important interlocutor for 25 years, outside of the range of those who should be taken seriously, effectively disappearing him from psychoanalytic history and discourses until his clinical diary. I mean, it's still probably disappeared today. It doesn't even matter if it's published today because we live in a Huxleyan dystopia of over-information. It doesn't even matter. People don't even want to read. It's too much emotional labor. But the damage had been done, although interpret because imagine for how many years you're not part of it and same thing with Krauss, so many others. Things are not even translated from German. And if they are translated, they're, they're translated in the orthodoxy. And many relational lists took up his care, ethic of care. The Freudian tradition, as well as the Kleinian and Lacanian schools, still prefers to forget his malignant ancestor, silencing impro improvishness seriously and often irreparably. I like how she includes Lacanian in here. Silencing after Freud, Freud, George Floyd. Let's also consider Fromm as an example of institutional shunning both by the Freudian establishment even amongst dissidents. Born in Frankfurt and rabbinical family, Fromm, I mean I like Eric Fromm, but let's see what she says about him. I'm not well versed enough to have a critique against him. He studied law, sociology, philosophy, psychology, and psychoanalysis in the Heidelberg School of Frieda fromm Heikman to whom he was briefly married and whom, after their separation, he helped to escape from Nazi Germany while emigrating himself to Geneva and, in 1934, to New York. Crucially, early influences by his own account included Talmudist Salman Baruch Rabinuk, 
sociologist Alfred Weber, brother of Max Weber, but in Fromm's words, a humanist, not a nationalist, and a man of understanding, courage, and integrity. Johann Jacob Bakofin, for the mother emphasis, Freud Ferenczi, George Grodock, uh, an analyst he knew as full of truth, originality, courage, and extraordinary kindness. Fromm had always Fromm had already in 1930s joined the Frankfurt School for Social Research and had completed his analytic training. After the war, he co-founded the William Allen White Institute and taught at the New School for Social Research until 1959. But by this time, he had written Escape from Freedom and The Art of Loving, oh God, and began to live the most of his time in Cuernavaca, Mexico, where he taught and wrote then he lived in Moralito, Switzerland, until his death. Though Fromm was and had remained enormously prominent as a social phenomenon, social philosopher, his relationship and phenomenon, his relationship to organized psychoanalysis concerns us here. In 1924, Frieda Fromm Reichmann Fromm helped to found the therapeutic in Heidel Therapeuticum in Heidelberg. After a brief training analysis in Berlin, where Hans Sachs, one of Freud's five inner circle of the famous rings, Fromm and Fromm Reichmann with Karl Laundrup and Heinrich Mank, Heinrich Mann, founded the South German Institute for Psychoanalysis in Frankfurt. Fromm joined in 1929. Fromm joined Frankfurt School the following year in 1939, though after the public book burning in 1933, he and most Jewish German analysts prepared to leave. After his emigration to the U.S. in 1934, he began, while still working with Horkheimer, to collaborate with Harry Sack, Sullivan, and Clara Tar Thompson, and began his work with dissident Karen Horne. Uh, please read the global theory industry on this one. In 1943, Horne prevented him, as a lay analyst, from joining her newly founded institute. He then allied himself more firmly with Sullivan and Thompson to found the William Allenson White Institute in New York, where he taught ever since the home of interpersonal psychoanalysis. This institution, along with Theodore Reich's NPAP, National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis, became a refuge for non-medical analysts like Fromm. Importantly, however, Fromm regarded himself as a Freudian especially when the name C.G. Jung came up. Despite his extensive later critiques of Freud as authoritarian and his claim by 1937 that the unconscious was structured more by relatedness and culture than by sexual instincts, that's kind of, I'm saying, despite his Jungianism, he found Freud's central insight that most human motivation remains unconscious to be incontrovertible. We might even regard him as the first relational psychoanalysist, but he would have surely responded that this honor belonged to Ferenzi, Fromm. So Fromm's exclusion from the IPA as recounted in detailed Paul Rosanne and more compactly by Rainer Funk, dope name, and George Hogginson counts as a horror story easily to be confused with the forms of silencing within totalitarian regimes. Of course, the story begins in the Nazi Zeit, but it does not end there. By early 1933, Hitler came to power. Two-thirds of analysts loyal to Freud had already left Germany, most notably Max Ettington, founder of German Psychoanalytic Society, Deutsche Psychoanalytik Verein for Palestine, and Hans Sachs for Boston. Only Aryans, Felix Bohm and Karl Müller, Bunchevink were left to try to keep the DPV from the DPV within the IPA, communicating constantly with Ernest Jones in Britain and Anna Freud in Vienna. At first, they all tried, while all remaining Jewish analysts, except Edith Jacobson, imprisoned by the Nazis for her refusal to break patient confidentiality. Left Brecht, 1988. Non Aryans had lost even civil rights. Even after Matthias Goring, cousin of Hermann Goring, took over the DPV. Freud 
himself encouraged Bob and Muller Buscemi to keep psychoanalysis going in the Third Reich, just as long as they kept out revisionists like Harold Schultz Heink, a Gentile married to a Jewish woman, so only temporarily protected anyway, and William Reich. Interesting. Better to have the National Socialist control psychoanalysis than to permit dissidents or leftists. <laughs> Jones wrote to Anna Freud in July of 1936 about Goring, a cousin of the famous addict. I mean, you can see that Hitler was also did all of these cocaines. You can see there's a there's a video of him tripping or you know, fiending or whatever. It was easy to get on excellent terms with Goring, who is very sympathetic personality. We can easily bend him our way, but unfortunately, so can other people. Some, and this is interesting, summarizing this non-thinking that uh, Arendt talks about is present right there. Summarizing this context from for Fromm's expulsion from the IPA, I quoted at length from the historian psychoanalysis Peter Leuvenberg. So it, this is interesting. So although the IPA wasn't expelling the, you know, the the Nazi regime, it, it was expelling from. Freud was, all, was clearly more interested in preserving the organization and presence of psychoanalysis in the Third Reich than he was in the dignity and self-esteem of the Jewish colleague or in the conditions that are necessary for psychoanalysis to function as a clinical therapy. Again, this is understandable if we can look at the full context of what's going on. It is painful and mortifying to read the record of how the leaders of an honored institution in order to save the organization and promote the careers of new successors to leadership humiliated and cast out a large majority of its members to accompany compendate to totalitarian state. This is like another version of Arendt's uh, calling out of the Jewish rabbinic people because you know, Freud is you know, one of these rabbis here. That a scientific, quote-unquote, or for that matter, a humanistic, quote-unquote, society would exclude qualified members for ethnic, racial, religious, or other extra intrinsic grounds for sake of the existence of the institution defies the autonomy of science from political ideology and the morality of valuing individuals, which is the humane, liberal essence of psychoanalysis itself. Perhaps, if you have a, you have a high perspective of psychoanalysis and you're not really talking about the contributions that those insane experiments had done to the to the field and then the afterwards how all of these nazi scientists were accepted into the cia and so far from who had joined the dpd from the emigrating 1934 soon received a letter from muller bachschenbank asking for his dues Short of funds, Fromm said he would pay in installments, but then in 1935 wrote to ask Müller Bursenbank, who forwarded Fromm's letter to Jones in London, about the rumor that Jewish anal analysts had been excluded from the DPV. The DPV, as a result of the July 1936 agreement between Jones, Brill, Müller Bursenbank, and Bohm, continued to be a member of the IPA and became part of the Goring Institute. The DPV celebrated Freud's 18th birthday, but no Jews were allowed. <laughs> In his usual evasive style, Jones wrote to Fromm, Dr. Müller-Bursenbank forwarded to me your letter of compliance considering the resignation of the Jewish members. It is not literally true that they have been excluded, but after a considerable discussion in Berlin between them and their colleagues, a discussion at which I also was present, they subsequently decided it would be in everyone's interest for them to send in their resignation. It was plain to me that there was no alternative, and indeed, I may tell you that I am daily expecting to hear the whole German society itself being dissolved. Hmm. As regards the question of communicating with you, you will doubtless understand that it is far from easy to write from Berlin. There are also appears to be a misunderstanding in the matter of which I am more to blame than Dr. Müller-Brüchling. They assume that I would notify the German members living abroad, whereas this was not quite clear in my mind. I noticed those in England and evidently thought this would suffice. You are the only other member in this category, and I do not. I had thought that you were 
now a member of the New York Society. Jones, knowing that as a lay analyst, Fromm would have had difficulty joining an American component society of the IPA, then offered him nonsen, or direct membership, that is something analogous to a nonsen passport for refugees with membership not dependent on belonging to a component society. Fromm accepted, and Jones immediately confirmed his membership in the IPA in 1936. The next episode, reported by Rosen, occurs after the war. Fromm, living and teaching in Mexico, discovered in the early 50s that he was no longer listed as a direct member of the IPA. Again, I want to talk about for, for a moment, because I want to connect this all to the modernity, is Bell Hooks loves Eric Fromm and her and her whole and my whole thing about um, all about love, it's all about the death of love, I keep saying, that's directly related to all of this stuff as well. I would greatly appreciate it. Oh, so, so he wrote to, oh, this is from talking, so I'm not going to talk like that. So I'm going to talk like this. I would greatly appreciate if you would be so kind enough to, for me, on the following question. I have been a member at large of the International Psychoanalytic Association since about 1934 when I have had to resign from the German Psychoanalytic Association. I find that my name does not appear anymore on the IPA association list at members at large, although I have never resigned, nor was I ever notified as a termination of my membership. Could you be so kind enough to let me know what my status as a member is? Eifler replies, a study in Kant and dissimulation begin as, as follows. Membership in the IPA depends on your membership in the component society of the IPA. You are listed as a member Washington Psychoanalytic Society, which is not itself a component society of the IPA, but is an affiliate society of the Americans. Such a bureaucratic bullshit. She follows by saying that the old DPB no longer exists, not true and irrelevant from to Fromm's question. Membership of large in the IPA may be acquired ex in exceptional cases, but those who were previously members of a component society of the IPA, a number of lay analysts in this country who are not members of the American Psychoanalytic Association, APA, but who reapplied for membership in the IPA, were willing to be screened by the Joint Screening Committee of the International and American Association. Oh God. It's getting Kafka-esque. This committee was established in the Congress of Amsterdam in 1951 in order to help appraise of foreign lay analysts for reinstatement of their membership in the IPA. It consists of three ex-officio members, the president of the American Psychoanalytic Association, the chairman of the board on professional standards of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and a member of the central executive of the International Psychoanalytic Association, who is a member of the American Psychoanalytic Association. At present, applications for reinstatement should be sent to me as chairman of Joint Screening Committee and should include a detailed curriculum vitae, including our present activities. I hope that this gives you the information which you have requested. We may note several aspects of this response. It does not explain how Fromm came to be dropped from his at-large membership. It does not acknowledge his already substantial contributions to the psychoanalysis and related fields. It more than hints that there would be prejudice against him, both for being foreign and both for being a lay analyst. And it suggests that someone with extensive training and achievements will have to start all over to document them. Fromm called her out, asking her to state clearly what the IPA and or she was doing. I take it clearly that if I want to continue my status as a member at large of in the IPA, I would have to present the application for reinstatement. Before I make a decision, I would very much like to understand the situation a little bit better, and I would greatly appreciate it if you could enlighten me on the question of what is meant by a screening of previous analysts, previous members at large. Does it mean that it is considered that they lost their status as members at large and that the screening amounts to practically a new application for membership? Or if not, according to what principles is such a screening carried out? What, for instance, 
the fact that my psychoanalytic views do not correspond to the views of the majority be one of the factors to be taken into consideration at the screening and the reason for denial of membership? I have to confess that even I have to confess even to an ignorance concerning the principles governing the American Psychoanalytic Association with regards to the acceptance of members. Is there any rule as a matter of principle the American Association excludes the all non-medical analysis? Now, I'm going to pause here and say the same stuff is happening today with the American Psychological Association, all this stuff. So this is, this is all... And right now, the books I'm reading are mostly with people who are like excommunicated from this, from that, <laughs> from the whole thing. So that's, it's just funny because the excommunication culture has continued to, to this day. It is unclear whether Fromm knew at this point the number of lay analysts in the U.S. had gained I IPA membership after the 1951 con Congress. It doesn't seem like he knows. He clearly had some come to suspect that this, quote, screening meant to protect, quote, the movement, quote, from the heterodox views that it was bureaucratic form of silencing dissent and creativity. Eisler's next response, still attempting to hide her tracks, was decisive for him. At the 17th International Psychoanalytic Congress in Amsterdam, 1951, the Joint Screening Committee of the IPA and APA was established for the purpose of giving lay analysts in North America who are not members of the APA and who had lost membership of the IPA through the change of statutes of the International the opportunity to be reinstated to membership. The American Psychoanalytic Association does not recognize lay analysts as members except who had been members before 1939. All those lay analysts who used to be members at large in the IPA and reside in North America have to reapply for membership through the Joint Screening Committee. Most of the former lay members at large have done so. The reinstatement depends on the recommendation of the committee, which consists of three ex-officio members, the president of the American Psychoanalytic Association, the chairman of the board of standards of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and a member of the central executive of the IPA, who is also a member of the APA. I am, of course, not in the position of anticipating the recommendation of the Joint Screening Committee. Personally, though, I would assume that anyone who does not stand on the basic principles of psychoanalysis would anyway not be greatly interested in becoming a member of the International Psychoanalytic Association. Oh, what a jerk. From <laughs> wrote back that, of course, he agreed with the, quote, basic principles of psychoanalysis but this that these might not be narrowly or broadly understood <laughs> yes because freud himself disagreed with himself roth eisler had made it clear to him that he would never be told why he had been dropped and that he would never likely be reinstated even Otto Frankl, Viennese psychoanalyst and emigrate to Los Angeles who shared Fromm's political positions, thought Fromm deserved to be excluded, excommunicated for being psychoanalytically unorthodox. The Gogans, Gogan and Gogan, comment on the 1951 readmission of the DPV to the IPA. This is all CIA shit right here. By supporting the admission of the DPV into the IPA, the leadership of the World Psychoanalytic Association community had chosen to place theoretical orthodoxy as a more significant factor in readmission than the nutsification of the members being admitted. Oh, man. Now, isn't this a study in complicity? Isn't this a study in psychological complicity? Isn't this the beginning of the neoliberal psychocompulsion that... Little wonder then, then two years later, Fromm could so easily be excluded for heretical views. The upshot of the story, psychoanalysis silenced a pioneering interdisciplinary and creative voice. Within Eric Fromm speaking at the IPA and writing in the psychoanalytic journals, we might have arrived at the ethical turn decades earlier, challenging the isolation of clinical work from the cultural, social, and ethical political context in which it tries to understand human suffering. Eric Fromm himself went on to become widely known, obviously, 
You have or to be. Let us hear this prophetic voice lost to most of psychoanalysis and more. Once more. To experience my unconscious means that I must know myself as a human being. That I know that I carry within myself all that is human. That nothing human is alien to me. That I know and I love the stranger because I have ceased to be a stranger myself. The experience of my unconscious is the experience of my humanity, which makes it possible for me to say every human being, I am thou, Martin Buber here. I understand you in all your basic qualities, in your goodness and your evilness, and even in your craziness, precisely because all this is in me too. Not only clarity and tolerance in general to my fellow man follows from this experience, but specifically the capacity of the analyst to understand his patient. He may know a great deal about a patient, but he will never know him, understand him, only when he was found in himself, even though in a larger degree all the tendencies and desire he de tries to discover in his patient's unconscious. Now, this is amazing, because the same things that have happened to Fromm, Fromm becomes the new Israel, <laughs> and then... The same kind of things happen to the new generation of people as well. That's what's interesting. Unsilencing. Besides reading the silenced voices in psychoanalytic history, besides bringing Adler, 